Evet, Günaydın herkese. Ee, benim ismim Yasemin e, Bugün sizlerle e, arkadaşlarımla beraber proje yazma eğitimi kampı diye tabir ettiğimiz alt tezinin oluşan bir eğitim için buradayız. E, şimdilik olarak aslında bu kampların hepsi, proje yazma kampların hepsi yüz yüze organize edildi. Ama maalesef e, son aylarda yaşadığımız koronavirüs tedbirlerinden dolayı artık yüz yüze etkinlikler yapamıyoruz maalesef. O yüzden bugünkü etkinliğimiz de e, online Zoom platformu üstünden gerçekleşecek. E, eminim de beni Zoom'a alışırsınız. Aylardır kullandığımız bir platform. E, ayrıca soru cevap, e, daha interaktif yapmak için soru cevap kısmını idare etmek için slide ödüyor. Başka bir yıldızım kullanıyor olacağız. E, eğer bu iki platformla ilgili de sorularınız olursa lütfen bizlere chat box'tan yazın. Teknik arkadaşlarımız yardımcı olmaya çalışacaklar. E, bugünkü e, eğitimin amacı aslında sizleri biraz yedi ekimde son katılıp e, gerçekleşecek olan e, Kobi aracı, eski adı, yeni adı akseleratör olan programla ilgili bilgilendirmek. E, 7 Ekim'deki e, katılıma başvuracak olanlarınız eminim vardır. E, o yüzden bu etkinliğin önemli olduğunu düşünüyoruz. Eğer e, listenizle ilgili spesifik sorularınız varsa mutlaka lütfen çıkmaktan e, sormaya çekinmeyin. E, seans esnasında ya da e, seans içinde yarım saat açık olacak bir atlama esnada. E, tüm e, kayıtlar, sunumlar ve soruların cevapları size eğitim sonunda vereceğim e, web sitelerinde yayınlanacaktır. E, bugün genel olarak aslında proje yazarken odaklanmamız gereken e, başlıklar, üç ana başlık var biliyorsunuz. E, mükemmeliyet, e, etki ve uygulamaz diye geçen üç ana başlık. E, bu başlıklar aslında nelere dikkat etmek gerekiyor? E, teklifi nasıl hazırlamamız gerekiyor? Nasıl tekrarlayacak teklif hazırlanır? Bu konulara değiniyor olacağız. E, bu etkinliğimiz Avrupa Birliği ve Türkiye Cumhuriyeti tarafından ortak finanse edilen Ufuk 2020'de Türkiye Fırsatı Projesi kapsamında finanse edilen bir e, e, etkinlik. E, benim görevimde bu projede kod aracı uzun olarak çalışmak. E, daha önce 4 sene programda Avrupa e, Komisyonu'nda Brüksel'de hakim olarak, uzaktan değerlendirici olarak çalıştım ve projeleri değerlendirdim. E, bugün e, benimle birlikte burada İngiltere'den e, uzun Philip Soldum. Ee, Yunanistan'dan uzmanımız Grigori Tacikostas ve Çipçak'tan değerli meslektaşım Tarık Şahin Güzelli olacak. Onlar da sizlerle sunum yapıyor ve sorularınız konusunda yardımcı oluyor olacaklar. Ee, yaklaşık 35 tane kayıbımız var. Ee, proje yazma kampı olduğu için e, kısık sayıda e, kısıtlanıcıya yer verildi bu etkinlikte. E, o yüzden interaktif olması açısından dediğim gibi lütfen sorularınızı sormaktan çekinmeyin. E, Seans kapandıktan sonra yani eğitim bittikten sonra bu platform e, yaklaşık bir yarım saat açık olacak. Bu esnada da sorularınızı sorabilirsiniz. Cevapları daha sonra web sitelerinde yayınlanacak dediğim gibi. E, umarım e, etkinliğimizi faydalı bulursunuz. E, e, Döküman, pasyon ve e, süreç İngilizce olduğu için eğitimlerimiz İngilizce ama e, sunma esnasında aklınıza pek tam anlamadığınız bir şey olursa Türkçe sormaktan çekinmeyin. Ya da sorularınızı daha rahat ifade edebileceğinizi düşünüyorsanız gene Türkçe sorabilirsiniz. E, Tarih bir yerde ben burada Türkçe konuşuyor olarak size bu konuda yardımcı olacağım. E, ben şimdi sözü e, Tarih Bey'e devrediyorum. Tekrar görüşmek üzere. Çok teşekkürler Yasemin Hanım. Herkese merhaba. E, Turkey Horizon projemiz kapsamında gerçekleşen proje yazma kampı etkinliğine bütün katılımcılarımıza hoş geldin diyor, demek istiyorum. E, ben bir sunumla başlayacağım. O yüzden hemen e, ekran paylaşımını açıyorum. Zannediyorum. Evet şu anda galiba oldu. E, Yasemin Hanım'da bahsettiği gibi e, etkinliklerimiz İngilizce gerçekleşecek. O yüzden ben sunum, e, sunumda da İngilizce olarak başlayacağım. Ama e, siz Türkçe'de sorabilirsiniz. Hiçbir sıkıntı yok. Biz size yine aynı şekilde cevap verebiliriz. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, hello to uh, Philip and uh, Grigori at the same time. As you all know, TÜBİTAK is the national coordination uh, institution of Horizon 2020 in Turkey. Uh, we have a national coordination office which is dedicated to Horizon 2020. Uh, we have a national, uh, we have uh, in this office national contact points uh, working on many different themes under uh, Horizon. Uh, my name is Tarık Şahin. I am the national contact point for SMEs. Uh, I'm working with uh, Ms. Merve Diyar on the same topic. Uh, the national coordination office in Tübitak has an official website, uh, which is named Ufuk 2020 or TR. 
Uh, we use this website to disseminate all kinds of information about Horizon in Turkey. We strongly recommend you to register uh, to our webpage while registering. You are going to be asked to uh, select the areas you are interested in. Uh, while doing so, you will receive newsletters about the uh, areas you selected. It means you will be able to learn about the information or call announcements as soon as we upload on the web page. Uh, when you enter the website, you can find us under the title Kobi Destekleri, uh, as you see on the screen, uh, which is shown. Uh, we, uh, we share all information about SME program on this page. You can also reach our contact details on the right side of this page. Uh, as you see on the screen, there is a, a section named Kim Kimdir uh, on, on, on the right up. Uh, Contact details of all NCPs uh, can be found on this uh, section. Uh, I would like to uh, mention that we are here and ready for your questions all the time. As you know, uh, today's focus is on Accelerator program. This program is dedicated to support high-risk projects of high potential SMEs. Uh, European Commission is also offering equity uh, in addition to the grant support to your project. Uh, there are very uh, limited numbers of remaining calls uh, under Horizon 2020 because it is the last, last year of the program. And this call is very unique with its bottom-up approach. There is no limitation on the team. Uh, the program is going to be covered very detailed by our experts, so I'll, I will not go further, but uh, I just want to emphasize that the only cutoff date uh, to which you can submit your proposal is uh, on the 7th of October, so I don't want any SMEs uh, we are, which are present here at the moment to miss their final opportunity before the new uh, program. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope uh, that I have encouraged you to take another look at what Tubitak has to offer uh, SMEs, especially on support for Horizon 2020 and Accelerator. I shall be here with the other panel members to deal with your questions later. An innovative, believable and realistic proposal is essential when you apply for Accelerator funding and today's event should help you to achieve this. I would now like to hand over to Philip Soden our SME expert on the Turkey and Horizon 2020 project. He will give a brief reminder of Horizon 2020 and accelerator requirements before handing over to Grigori for the main presentation. Flip, floor is yours. Hello, uh, I should say. Merhaba, uh, günaydın, hoş geldiniz. Um, my name is Philip Salden. Uh, as I said, um, as Tarek said, there we are. Um, background in manufacturing, just to give you a bit of background on me, manufacturing, lots of SME programs. Um, I've worked with the EEC for over 30 years um, and I've been working in Turkey for many years almost the past 12 years continuously. So I've seen lots of SMEs in Turkey, spoken to lots of people and um, had some very good experiences. I'm missing Turkey at the moment with the, uh, the problems, but hopefully those problems will soon go away and we shall all be back together again. So uh, just a brief um, chat about um, Horizon and Accelerator, and then we're on to the main event with uh, Gregoris. So this is the team behind the project, uh, five of us, and three of us are online today. Um, Odysseus is not with us, he deals with legal and financial issues, and Alexander's the team leader. Um, he deals with the interface between the project and universities and intermediaries. So Turkey and Horizon 2020, uh, this is phase two of the project. We were here uh, for two years before this project. Uh, the key objectives, uh, obviously, to support Turkish participation in Horizon 2020 and to strengthen the national capacity in science, technology and innovation. Um, we help to do that by uh, facilitating the integration of the Turkish researchers 
with uh, opposite numbers in Europe. And we have various means of doing that, which I shall mention in a moment. Um, the project runs uh, around from the 7th of January 2019 and will run into the first quarter of 2022. So we're around for a while longer. The activities, um, lots of training events. This is one of them. Um, we have focus groups who deal with particular areas of science and technology. We have events on intellectual property, risk finance. Uh, we run webinars um, and we have uh, lobbying project writing camps and so forth. This being one of the project writing camps. Uh, networking, uh, major brokerage events with hundreds of people attending to find partners across Europe um, in a more formal way than uh, just through the internet and so forth. It's good to meet people as we know. Um, international visits to see what other countries are doing on particular areas of technology and again to build partnerships. Uh, we shall have award ceremonies when the situation allows. Uh, we have conferences and info days, various things. Focusing on SMEs, my area, um, obviously SME is very important to the economy. So there's a special set of measures for SMEs, one-to-one um, -one consultancy, uh, training on project writing. We had an event a few days ago, uh, project writing camp as this one specifically for SMEs um, and various means of linking in with the other aspects of the program. And finally, uh, we have various tools available. Our website, which has lots and lots of information, including the presentations today and the questions and answers that we shall receive later. A help desk, if you have any problems, phone in, as well as Jubitat, we can also help. And we have guides on the uh, programme, on Accelerator particularly, there's a detailed guide of how it all works. So a quick look at Horizon to remind ourselves, Horizon 2020 runs until the end of this year, so uh, it's coming very close now, and then Horizon Europe will take over for the next six years. People say to me, why should we participate? It can be difficult to get funding, um, and you know, it's not just about funding. I think that's the first point I would make. It, it gives you access to uh, wider technologies across Europe through partnerships um, with industry, academia, companies like yourself. It can open up new markets in those countries. They can make connections for you in those markets. Um, it gives you an insight into standards and regulations which are coming up um, on new technologies. And it amplifies the impact of your own national investment uh, through the ministries and Tubitac. So overall, the aim, of course, um, is to improve the economic and social situation in those countries that participate. Of course, the money is there. I'm not saying it's not important by any means. Um, Horizon 2020 had a budget of 80 billion and Horizon Europe up to that by 10 billion. So innovation is seen as important, vital to the future of Europe. And even though there are lots of other ways of uh, spending commission money, uh, there's still a huge budget allocated to the innovation side of things through Horizon Europe. Um, on Horizon 2020, you may have seen this before, uh, three main pillars of support, excellence in science through Marie Curie and various scientific investments. Um, on the right, we have social challenges dealing with the aging, uh, the health, uh, migration and so forth. And in the center, industrial leadership, and there we sit with the innovation instrument at 3 billion euros at centre stage. This will change a little on Horizon Europe, essentially still three pillars. They've shuffled around some of the uh, topics, but you'll see there pillar three, um, even more prominence given to innovation with the European Innovation Council um, and various other actions to encourage innovation across Europe. So innovation is still vital and now has its own pillar. You may have seen this recently. There was a lot of publicity about the European Green Deal. This is within pillar three, and it's hoped that, that will stimulate a trillion euros of public and private sector investment. A trillion euros is a million million. That's a huge amount of money. 
Um, it's public and private. So although the Commission are putting funds into the Green Deal, uh, the majority of it is expected to come from industrial investment and other public funding. Um, worth taking a look at the Green Deal, lots of different topics there from emissions through to uh, farming and biodiversity, water quality. Um, the Green Deal is a sort of umbrella over lots of technologies that arguably already exist. So um, if you look at the bottom line there, it will mobilise research and stimulate innovation. So innovation is still the driver here. And when you have proposals, it's worth looking to see where they might fit. For instance, on ICT, it's always oversubscribed. But if it applies to, say, health or learning or saving the environment or improving farming, there might be a better chance of funding through a different avenue. So putting a slightly different twist on your proposal uh, might mean that you're more successful in an area with fewer bidders. So uh, Horizon Europe and uh, Accelerator are still aimed at SMEs, 1 to 250 the official line, and up to 250, sorry, up to a 50 million euro turnover. That's a huge figure and it may seem silly for SMEs, but if you think about a fully automated car factory, it may only have 200 employees, but a turnover much bigger than that. So it's a way of controlling um, the uh, industries with fewer employees and high automation. I mentioned SMEs earlier being very important in European economies, and of course they're very important in Turkey. Uh, a lot of um, uh, moves can be pro and against SMEs. Why do we spend on all these small businesses? Big businesses need the money. Well, funding is there for big businesses, but SMEs are very important. And you see there in Turkey, uh, over 90% of businesses are SMEs. They account for nearly 80% of employment and over half of GDP. So they are vital. Uh, and the case is the same in any country. So a quick look at Accelerate then, the SME instrument. There's this confusion goes on between SME instrument and Accelerator uh, because Accelerator is a pilot under Horizon 2020 until Horizon Europe takes over, but we don't expect there to be many changes, if any changes. So what's the purpose? Um, you may have seen this Death Valley of Innovation that's given all sorts of names, but um, typically on the left there, you have research funding through universities and major investment through governments and the EU. You remember pillar one was about excellent science. So you have a lot of investment in research and then it tapers off as it gets towards development because a lot of it is about blue skies research. And if you look then at the adoption of an idea from research into a commercial product, the commercial side of things only really get interested when it looks as though it's going to be successful. So you may begin with angel investors and then it climbs to venture capitalists and eventually industry will fund it. So in the middle, there's this funding gap. You can see the blue lines there um, where it's difficult to make the transition from research to commercial products. And this is where Accelerator sits. Now under Horizon, it was quite a, a restricted area. Uh, you see by the blue lines. Under Accelerator, the line has been moved way over to the right. So the Commission can now invest and link up with private investors and take the idea, the product, well into the commercial stage. So this is a big change and one that companies should capitalise on. I'm sure you've seen this TRL level, Technology Readiness Level diagram before. It was created, I think, by NASA for their space programmes and it, it apportions the different stages of research and idea all the way through at the top there from idea to production at the bottom. Now, Accelerator is interested in six to nine, um, six being the minimum, the prototype system, and nine, the full commercial application. Um, Gregoris will tell us much more about this but it shows that the correct TRL level, deciding which of those you sit in and being honest with yourself, which TRL level, it's very important. Uh, because when you apply to the commission, 
um, you have to agree at the onset whether you're interested in blended finance, which brings in the uh, private sector and the European venture capital funding. Um, you have to consider whether you want to be involved from the outset. Uh, if you are, then of course the investment is subject to due diligence by the funding body, as you would expect. So, um, other policy shifts, the, the focus is very much on commercial prospects. Um, there was mention earlier that the Commission uh, will fund risks. What the Commission like to do is to fund the riskiest part of a project. If you have a project which looks as though it's going to be a huge commercial success, but there's an element of risk that's stopping private investment, that's what the Commission are interested in. And it's important to remember that they are looking at the risky part of investment. They're not the same as any other investor. They want the risk. So emphasize that element of risk and make that the focus of what you're looking for in funding. So the emphasis because it's more commercial. So they're looking at market impact, satisfying market need. They've removed the thematic areas that were there before where um, they had different topics as themes. The calls are open, they have cut-off dates, and as Tarek said, the last cut-off is on the 7th of October, uh, but then they'll carry on, of course, into Horizon Europe. Um, much more private sector financing and the EC's own venture capital fund, so they can actually invest EC money into a project. They will do this in order to get it to a commercial stage. They're not interested in retaining that uh, capital involvement and making any profit from it. They simply want it to be handed over to the commercial sector. Otherwise, it would be unfair competition, of course. And they see it as overall uh, supporting SMEs that need one last push to get to market readiness. So the funding, um, it can look complicated, but um, phase one, of course, finished in 2019, the feasibility is. The phase two, which is now the only available set of grants. Um, again, Grigoris will uh, talk about this, but 70% up to 2.5 million. And then blend of finance kicks in for the higher TRL levels. Uh, there's a phase three coaching and mentoring, which is there for all the successful projects free of charge. And again, a reminder, 7th of October cutoff day. How's it doing? Well, it's close to the end of of run, so 2.9 billion spent out of the 3 billion allocation, nearly 6,000 companies. What seems like a low success rate, but uh, remember um, it's, it's based on the quality and the innovative aspect of your proposal. Don't worry about the fact that the success rate can be low, just make yours uh, fit with that success level. Um, in achieving that, of course, it's not a loss if you don't actually win the funding because you've had to put together a bid that might be applicable somewhere else. You could reapply. It's also taught you a lot of lessons, I think, about um, getting together a proposal, the finances, doing some strategic thinking and so forth. This data is carried live on this website um, so you can look and see where the projects are. You can see how Turkey performs against the others, uh, where the projects have been allocated and so forth. A useful website. This presentation, along with the others, by the way, will be on our website, so you can refer back to it um, at some later point. So what do they look for in an accelerator proposal? There are six uh, key areas um, listed there from cross-border, high-growth, disruptive, close to market, scalable, and at the prototype stage. Let's just take a quick look at those to remind ourselves. Cross-border is fairly obvious. It has to be relevant to Europe as a whole in terms of innovation potential, job creation, growing the knowledge base. But of course, it's even better if it crosses out of European borders and uh, has a chance of global success. So you must show that it's not just about something for Turkey. It's about uh, something that will apply in other countries across Europe and ideally across the world. High growth, a difficult one, uh, but just being able to demonstrate um, a good rate of growth. The OECD talk about 20% a year for three to five years. 
Mm. But they also take into account the high growth potential of your project in your company. So uh, that's another way of showing potential high growth. But they're obviously looking to invest in a growing business rather than a declining business. That's the main um, idea. There are then uh, four related areas, uh, disruptive innovation, close to the market scalability, and at the prototype stage. Um, at the TRL level six, I've already mentioned six or above. The degrees of innovation, um, I always, three acceptable levels, incremental, the small change that influences growth, step change, which are more significant, bringing in new technology and giving a market lead. But disruptive is the one that the Commission really would like to see. This is creating new markets and value by disrupting the existing markets. So um, I use the camera as an example. Uh, we had film cam. something that's beginning to be ready for market it's had all the glitches ironed out and finally tower level nine is the full commercial product when we talk about product of course it can be software or a, a sort of tangible item um, they're all products scalability um, literally getting more out than you put in uh, from your investment it begins to have mass sales um, and then, of course, bring in more profit. So ideal if the evaluators can see that a product is scalable and you're, you've convinced them in your proposal that you have scalability. And we mentioned the minimum at the prototype stage. Three criteria for awards. Um, excellence. Does it have potential beyond the state of the art? Is it excellent technology? impact does it meet market needs and expressing market needs and giving evidence of market needs is so vital um, often impact comes before excellence excellence before impact it's arguable which way around of course but absolutely essential uh, but behind that there's implementation um, do you have a good plan of how you can do this uh, do you have a good team? Is it a strategic, strategic fit with the business? Um, are you convincing that you can make this happen? Now, all of these are covered in a number of presentations and recordings of webinars and guides which sit on our website. So I would strongly recommend you uh, to go through those um, if you want further information. So what impresses the EC most? Uh, just to finish on uh, this slide. Um, they're looking for impact. Uh, they want to see that there's a market need, you've identified the need, and that you will have an impact in the market as quickly as possible, provided that they give you the funding for the element of risk that will make it commercial. So behind that, there's the excellence of the idea that will uh, make that impact. And finally, uh, the implementation that will see the excellence uh, given impact uh, into the marketplace. So this is what they're after. Now in Turkey, I must compliment the country on the investment in innovation and science. It's been a huge investment and I think is uh, comparable with any country in the world. But many of the projects and companies are backed by scientists and engineers uh, who've had a university life. Um, they're used to the research process and they think we can set up a business there's funding to do this so we know how to do research we know uh, how to make an idea work through and we have the team to do it so let's look for an idea that fits with our way of doing things um, and we can get grants for that and often they don't look at the market need at the impact it will make whether there's anything else in the market uh, and whether they could have a place in the market. And this is what goes in the proposal. And this is a, a fundamental difference, as you can see, between the EC thinking and a lot of companies thinking. So it's worth looking at your proposal to make sure that you 
uh, do have enough detail on impact and market, there isn't an assumption that the market's there or an assumption that the market wants what you're prepared to offer. You must see what the market need is before you start beginning uh, forming ideas and projects behind it. So uh, key conclusions, um, participation brings many, many benefits and not just finance, but of course finance is the attractive part as well. Uh, but it helps you with your partnerships and looking at new technology and all the other things I talked about. It's highly competitive. There are lots of applications for this funding. So you must be the best uh, in that sense. There's no uh, will do, um, it has to be the best. Do focus on the needs before the solutions. It's often the wrong way around, a solution looking for a need instead of a need looking for a solution. Uh, be more aware of the markets in that sense and what the competition are doing and be realistic about the true potential of the project. I've seen projects which are going to make a 50 million euro profit in the first year. Impossible really to achieve that as an SME, so be realistic. And of course, training is needed to optimise the chances of success, which neatly brings me to my colleague Grigoris, who will offer training um, in these areas. So there's our contact details. Uh, that's all from me, but I'll be staying online to deal with any questions you have. And uh, over to Gregoris. Good morning, Gregoris. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, the participation. Uh, I will now try to share my screen. Great. Thank you very much, Philip. So let's start with this one. Philip, you will allow me to start with excellence. Uh, sorry, no. Yeah, whichever, whichever way. No, no, no, no, no. This is not the one, I'm sorry. It's this one, yes. Great. And we go like this. So, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, First, let me kindly introduce myself. I'm Grigoris Hadzikostos. I'm Greek, working for the past 70 years as a foot soldier in the European projects game. I, am, uh, I have been involved in many projects as uh, a proposal writer, project manager, work package leader, coordinator. But also for the past uh, six years, I've been involved in uh, training, mentoring and coaching and supporting researchers and startup uh, uh, companies uh, on uh, proposal writing. Uh, I've been working in countries like, of course, my own country, Greece, in Serbia, where I was uh, situated for uh, seven years, in Lithuania, Bulgaria, Tunisia, Poland, and of course, I'm privileged for the past few years to be working closely with this stellar team of uh, Turkey Horizon 2020 project. These are some of the projects that you will see that have been involved, and one of the special flavors of the projects that I always like is the so-called cascade funding projects. The cascade funding projects look very much like SME instrument phase one in the previous past, as it, they were giving small tickets for companies to develop a prototype. Therefore, I've been, I've been uh, very often uh, exposed to the challenges and the struggles, but also to the scale-up potential of some, some startups SMEs and some of the alumni of our accelerator program, this Cascade Funding program. They were afterwards uh, receiving VC funding or, uh, or even uh, SME instrument funding uh, from, uh, from the call. So it, I have seen the full path uh, of, of this uh, story. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, moving a company, uh, starting a company, moving into launching a product, the uh, so-called from zero to one, I think it's the most exciting part of the entrepreneurial journey. And having said that, uh, I would like now to learn a little bit more about you. So, we are going to use Slido today. Uh, I would like to kindly ask you to connect to slido.com with your uh, uh, computer or your mobile phone or your tablet, and then uh, add this hashtag. It's 9N119, hashtag N119. And there you will start seeing those questions. And the first question I want to know is, since this is a proposal writing camp, I would be very much interested to know about uh, your uh, previous uh, experience in proposal writing. What type of proposals you have been writing in the past? 
So please kindly give me some indications. Okay. Okay. I see there's quite some good experience in previous calls. One way or another, most of the participants are experienced in one or another kind of call. For example, we have very good experience in Turkish R&D calls, but also I see that uh, some of the participants tried their uh, uh, chances in SME instrument or ESC accelerator previously. Other Horizon 2020 calls, also some people have been involved in other EU projects. Good thing is that generally speaking, we are uh, we have a good and uh, committed, I would say, uh, team here. So I will now move to my next. I will go back to my other screen, and I will start right away with the topic. So the topic here is how to support you in writing a competitive proposal for the uh, Horizon uh, 2020 EAC Accelerator. Let's first look a little bit at the uh, uh, um, content proposal. So, at the content of the proposal, what we see is the template that it has, first of all, a summary, then the excellence part. The excellence part, one can think about it, uh, what we want to do. Then we're moving to the impact part, which is covering, in a way, why we want to do it. And then the implementation, which covers more or less how we were planning to do it what resources we're going to use, what the budget we're going to need, and so on and so forth. Then we have some very important uh, annexes. Annex 1 is not uh, relevant for everyone because it, it uh, touches upon security and ethics. So if your proposal has some considerations related to security and ethics, you need to be filling in this information. But if, you're, if your business is related to one of those topics one way or another, rather because you are, you are dealing with uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, security topics related to data or to physical infrastructure, or if you are doing uh, experiments that have an ethical dimension, you most likely already know the details that will be requested there. But uh, in, from my experience, for many companies, these topics are not relevant and they simply say non-relevant in all the, uh, the boxes. Then, of course, very important, the CVs of your, of your uh, team. Then you go to the other annex where you can put whatever document you want, like letters of support, letters of intent, and so on and so forth. Then you have a very important part about the financial and corporate information Excel file. By the way, uh, we had a webinar on financials uh, recently, and this webinar is recorded in YouTube, and you can find it in our YouTube channel. So I would like to invite you uh, to watch this if possible, because it might be useful for you. Uh, and then we have the last part, which is the pitch deck. The pitch deck is a pitch that you submit now, but it will only be uh, considered if you go through the first evaluation, if you are, the, if you are selected by the remote viewers for an interview to, to stand in front of the jury. Let's move, first of all, to the introduction. So, describe your innovation in no more than 200 words, avoiding jargon and technical language. Let me give you a simple example how we can uh, explain our innovation, explain ourselves. Let me, let me talk about myself. Let's suppose you meet me once this uh, whole thing with uh, Corona stops and we start traveling by plane again. Let's suppose that we meet each other in the queue of an airport where we're in the gate and we're uh, waiting to enter the, uh, the plane. And we start chatting to, to kill some time, to spend some time. And you ask me, what am I doing? I have two ways of explaining what am I doing. One way is to tell you that uh, I'm the training coordinator of the Turkey Horizon 2020 project phase two. The other way is to tell you I help companies and innovators to get money from the European Union. I believe you would agree with me that the second would really understand what I'm doing in my life. While the first one, you will be already overwhelmed by the jargon and you possibly change the topic or ask me something about the weather. Therefore, in order to, make, uh, to describe our innovation in, uh, in a way that everybody can understand it, we need to avoid the temptation of using uh, technical jargon, complicated words and anything. It's not here, it's not about uh, impressing a technical audience. It's giving a snapshot to everybody of what your company is doing. Another good way, I, I, my, another good example uh, I'm, I'm using is, I'm telling to people, please let's explain it the way we would explain it to our mothers. How, what are we doing? In, in, this requires a very a good uh, uh, communication uh, written in that aspect. 
Then, very important aspect to go over the idea and the solution, the innovation in the detail. Practically, we are requested here to solve the problem that we're solving, and then we move to the problem. Uh, if you remember uh, from uh, Philip's uh, introduction, we are looking for companies with global potential to scale up. Therefore, the problem they are, uh, they are supposed to be solving should be a global problem, or should be at least a problem that has a huge market. So, you are trying to, to explain how big is the challenge, how big is the problem that you are trying to, to address by bringing your innovation to the market. This is the point of this topic here is to explain the problem. And in order to explain the problem, there are many ways to reach from the problem to the solution. Another important aspect when you're describing your innovation is the, the visuals. It's how you're presenting it in a way that people understand it. And there are two ways you can present it. One is to present the technical component, and that are very important because people need to know, to understand that your prototype is mature, that you have all the components in place, and so on and so forth. At the same time, you need also to uh, be able to explain the functionality of your innovation, how this thing is working, or how it's going to be working in an operational environment. So here, for example, you see the different parts of the robot, you see the different components that integrate it all together, they create a, a spraying robot for orchards, and below what you see is how this robot is moving inside the field. So you can see exactly how the robot is navigating inside the orchard, how it's scouting and identifying the, the crops that need spray, and how it sprays selectively on the right spot. This is a way to, to convince the, the reviewer that you're not only mature from the technical side, but you also know uh, the, the practical uh, implications of what you're doing. Another example you can see here, again, you are, uh, you are demonstrating to the, to the reviewers uh, your equipment and how it works and what are the, all the different components of your prototype. And then we move towards the, uh, the functionality. We explain how this uh, innovation, how this device is supposed to be working in the course of, uh, of uh, the end user's request. Then, when you're talking about the objectives, it's very important that uh, uh, objectives need to be verifiable, measurable, and concrete, and they should be related to, to a particular uh, uh, call. Uh, also quite important in this case is that you, you, when you are uh, address, when you are put your objectives, you need first of all to think how this objective would be achievable, and second, and important, how these objectives would be achievable within the time frame of the project. Keep in mind that if your project is selected, the commission has a process upon which you will be assigned to a project officer. The project officer is very experienced in all these topics, but approaches the project from an administrative point of view. So your project officer will also look, always look at your objectives, at your KPIs with related to the objectives, as, as long as you tick the boxes, he or she will be happy. If for whatever reason you don't tick the boxes, you need to upfront, understand it, and negotiate with them to move the objectives. But in any case, your main, uh, your main uh, job here is to make sure that the objectives you are putting in your proposal are achievable within the time frame of the project. And uh, more normally, we start from a very generic objective. And then we move towards uh, specific objectives, which are more uh, specified technically. And those objectives need to be connected with concrete KPIs. So here you see the key performance indicators, but you also see the target values related to them. Moving from that, how do we make, how do we convince about the size of our problem? How do we convince the reviewers? How do we convince the, the people who are looking at our proposal that the problem is big? One way to do that is to connect it with, uh, with some kind of consumer survey. For example, we were talking earlier about a, a robot that is uh, spraying on the orchard. Uh, the residues of pesticides in fruit, vegetables, and cereals is the biggest uh, food-related concern of uh, European consumers. And you can, always find, you can always find the relevant data to do that, to, to prove that. Therefore, it's very important here when you are trying to explain the problem 
to try to base your argumentation on, on concrete, I would say, data from uh, studies from uh, European uh, Union uh, surveys, projects, etc. People say that uh, if you torture data long enough, they will uh, confess whatever you want them to confess. However, uh, you can see here, for example, the data can also be very useful to make a strong point. So, for example, let's say that the problem is that uh, how we would uh, reduce the meat consumption of, or because of its environmental uh, impact. So, for example, when we're talking about the problem of meat consumption, we can state that in the world, if the world ate 50% less meat, it would be like taking 240 uh, million cars off the road each year. Then if we continue to explain the challenge, we, we need to, un to understand and explain very well what are the sensitivities, what are the complications behind such a statement. For example, how are we going to re remove meat from our diet if we don't find uh, ways to, to uh, replace it uh, with other uh, similar uh, ingredients? Because this will result in health issues, this will result in brain chemistry imbalance, and so on and so forth. So, this is how we arrive to the solution. This is how we arrive to the concept, which is the alternative proteins, let's say. So, we, take, we start from a generic statement, we explain all the controversies and all the, all the uh, challenging topics within the context of this uh, challenge, and then we come up with a concrete solution, which is related to the innovations that we are planning to introduce in the market, we are planning to launch in the market. Now, in the part of innovativeness, uh, Victor Hugo used to say that all the forces in the world are not so powerful uh, as an idea whose time has come. So, here you have two different things. You need to explain why you are better or significantly different than existing alternatives. But also, you have to explain why this is the right timing for your innovation. And as you know, many companies fairly fair, uh, fail because they start a little bit too early or a little bit too late. This is the art of doing business, to understand where is the right timing, what is the right momentum to launch your product in the market. Then, when you're comparing yourself to existing uh, alternatives, practically when you're comparing yourself to your competition, it's very good to identify at this stage, here you are, you are kind of uh, uh, looking at the technical features and the price point. It's very important to, to identify your main competitors and uh, on the left, the way I see it uh, uh, in your, uh, your uh, table, you need to explain uh, what are the elements, what are the buying decision factors? What are the factors that influence the buying decision of the customer that the customer might be, consumer or B2B or government or whatever? Therefore, you need to identify a few of the decision making criteria and compare yourself with your competitors based on those criteria. This might be performance related technical criteria, it might be related to uh, who is the user that is addressed or some feature uh, of the product that is really game changing. For example, if a, if a device that is uh, uh, measuring the quality of meal or the health status of the, meal, the cow is hand, hand health, this means that it can be done not in the lab but directly on the field and this brings humongous benefits to the whole process plus very important strong benefits to the ones who are applying the technology. Therefore, you understand that this is a critical factor. So you see here, for example, how in the case of the, of the example of the device that is monitoring the quality of milk, how we uh, compare it with other methods or technologies. When it comes to the timing, there is a very, uh, a very good framework with respect to that. It's the, the so-called innovation hype cycle. Uh, these are the definitions, but instead of, of giving you the definitions, I think I would prefer to give you the example on the, on the uh, screen. So here you see uh, the first column is the innovation trigger, which is more or less uh, the case when one technology is long in the market and people have uh, start learning about it, start understanding it. They, they, they mostly it's the most tech-oriented people who first uh, 
uh, get in, in contact with it and then they start spreading the news, etc. If it goes through, I mean, if it's endorsed by enough geeks, allow me the term, then the technology goes into the peak of inflated expectations. This is a case uh, where people believe that one particular technology can pretty much solve everything. That it can give uh, answers to all the questions. I, I remember I was uh, discussing with some uh, uh, public sector officials uh, of a European country one or two years ago. I was putting them forward some challenges related to economy and they were telling me, but we're not really worried because we have blockchain now and it will solve all our problems. Don't get me wrong, blockchain is a fantastic technology. It can really uh, change a lot of things in the way we're doing things, but certainly cannot solve all the problems. And this is happening uh, uh, when we realize that, when we realize that this technology can actually not solve everything and maybe it's not so great and maybe uh, we need to continue doing things the way we're doing, then we're going into the uh, phase of disillusionment. So we are now uh, learning more about not only what the technology can do, but we start also understanding what the technology cannot do. And this is actually when it becomes interesting because then uh, it is a good filter. This means that many people who jump into the wagon in an from an opportunistic motives, they would be uh, excluded. In the same time, uh, people who are really serious and committed about developing and pushing this technology forward, they are making advances in the technology, making it more accessible to customers, more affordable or more useful. And then is when the technology is finally entering the so-called plateau of productivity. This is when the technology becomes a fully commercial uh, idea that the people can use and they can benefit from using it. So, speaking of the timing, the suggestion is that your, uh, the, the, the main conceptual elements of your technology, of your idea, should be somewhere in between innovation trigger and peak of inflated expectation. It should be something that, the, that the, there are many people who see uh, things happening, but also there are still great risks in applying. Because please remember, in this particular core, in EIC Accelerator, we are looking for uh, ideas with uh, the potential to scale up globally, but which are at the same time quite risky, because this is the gap we are aiming to. Going now, as we discussed a little bit about the technology readiness level. Uh, what they want here to be to do in the current state of development is they want to understand where are you now and the right position for you to be is either six or seven where you want to go with the EIC grant only the suggestion is to go toward PRL 8 taxing PRL 9 but when you really want to do part of investment that is uh, indeed on PRL 9 then you need to take advantage of the option for blended finance then they want to see how you arrived here. What was the uh, activities and the results you have achieved so far? Remember, since you are asked to deliver a prototype, to have a prototype for, for a demonstration, it means that you need to explain a little bit how you move from the idea to the prototype, what type of technical development you did, with what type of customer did you experiment, and so on and so forth. And then also, what are your next plans to take the innovation to the market? Let us see a little bit the current status. How do we explain our current status development? First of all, we explain it with respect to the services or the offer of the, or the uh, uh, functionalities we are offering, or sometimes with the functionalities of the product or the technical characteristics of the product that we are currently having. Then, another important uh, aspect that uh, explains our current stage of development is very much connected with. Uh, the way we are already dealing with problems and with customers. So, in the case of a solution which is about uh, smart agriculture, it's the number of the crop we are supporting, the diseases we are covering, the pests we are covering, possibly what type of uh, pilot uh, uh, cases we are running, and what uh, are we doing with respect to customers. And it's also very important to be able to put everything like that in the context of time. Meaning, you need to explain how you started in the past, how you moved forward, 
how your technology, how your Horizon 2020 project will uh, upscale, will upscale your uh, technology readiness level up to eight, and then how you are then going to uh, move into the commercial phase. This demonstrates that you understand how to connect the dots not only backwards but also forward, meaning that you can understand all the stages of development of your own idea and your company until it reaches the market. But also when we're talking about what's next, the, you need to be able to clarify uh, very briefly what are you planning to do to achieve this commercial deployment in terms of HR, in terms of functionalities, in terms of technical developments, in terms of new markets and new geographies. These are the elements that will demonstrate your scale-up potential and it, they will also demonstrate your rapid growth DNA. If you are already having plans for the next steps and the next steps and the next steps, this is the type of culture that we're expecting to see here. Then we go to the part of feasibility. And uh, when we go there, I would like, I, I'm not uh, recommending any book, and this is one of the many books that uh, exist in the topic, but I found it quite interesting. And this is called the, the Four Steps of the, to the Epiphany. This book by Steve Blank, it helps you a little bit to understand uh, the customer development process, the product development process, and how those two are interconnected. So on one hand, you, have, you are trying to understand better your customers, and on the other hand, you are trying to find your technology based on the needs of your customers. And this is a pro process that is uh, iterative, that it has many loops. And uh, based on that, you can explain the technological and economic feasibility. The practical feasibility is your ability to execute these uh, parallel experiments, these parallel activities faster and learn the most out of them. Uh, personally speaking, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of the Lean Startup methodology. Possibly many of you are also uh, familiar with it. And what I like about it is that unlike the traditional business methods that I was taught in uh, university many, many years ago, uh, this one is not trying to teach you how to succeed, but it's trying to teach you how to fail. But how to fail quickly, how to fail cheaply, and how to learn the most out of your failures. And I think this is the message here that they want to see. They want to see that you have a very good process when it comes to feasibility, to get the messages from your customers, process it, process them, translate them into uh, requirements of, the, of your product or service, execute the requirements, and then send it back to customers for further validation. This is the type of entrepreneurs they're looking to see. The ones who have in place the mechanisms to get the feedback of the market as quickly as possible. Again, when they're asking you to, to uh, put forward your risks, don't try to hide things below the camera. It's not a good strategy. It's not a good strategy at all. I would kindly suggest you to uh, put the risks forward. They are looking for big, risky investments. They are not looking for things which are like common sense and any investor could understand. The whole purpose of EIC Accelerator is to focus on investments that if they go well, they will have a huge potential and they will be unicorns and they will create many jobs, but they are in a way, in a way, in a sense, the, the typical uh, VC or the typical banking institution cannot understand, cannot, is not, does not feel comfortable with the level of risk that uh, they are brought. And this is, in a way, the, uh, the differentiator of the investment. So, bottom line, talk about your business risks clearly. Remember, here in this part, in section one, we are talking about uh, business risks. In section three, we're going to talk about the project risk, which is quite different. So here you are talking about business risk and always remember that it's okay for the project to have serious risk. In fact, they are looking for it. They are looking for risky projects with big potential. At this point, I would like a little bit to uh, give the floor to both Philip and Yasemin, because we are going to, to look a little bit at the criteria. And I would like to get their experience uh, by, by giving you some hints and tips with respect to this first, third, uh, the, uh, first set of criteria. And we have another slide coming up on this. So, Yasemin, may I give the floor to you to begin? Uh, thank you, Grigoris. So, in terms of high-risk criteria? 
Yes, let's let a little bit of this thing about the risk because, for example, uh, many companies are working in the discussion with them, we have them, they're kind of boring. Uh, but what what if they see things that my invention is very risky? What what is, what would be the case? Um, so we we need to uh, define a little bit the tricks how we present uh, our company as risky uh, yet promising. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, they are applying to fund their project, and every project is risky. They shouldn't forget this. Uh, if they don't mention about the risks, it means that they will not be prepared when risks come because uh, as we have seen, for example, in our case, uh, the coronavirus had emerged and uh, we have we now have to deal with this new environment and it is actually a big risk for many companies. And there may be some changes in the exchange rate, especially for countries like Turkey, which are not using euro. Uh, there may be risks regarding the exchange rates, etc. Uh, this type of risk, risk, risks are always there. And if you are dealing with a technology product, there are more risks, of course. Uh, but the important thing here is that uh, they have to think about technical risks, economical risks, social risks, and uh, environmental risks. And they have to make a plan B. And they have to convince the evaluators that uh, even if these big risks happen, they will be uh, able to deal with those risks because they will be prepared. Uh, so a good risk assumption and risk mitigation strategy should be prepared. Uh, the evaluators are uh, giving quite high importance to this, actually. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question to Philip. In the third criteria here, we, we see the highly innovative solution that goes beyond, so beyond the state of the art that's different to anything else we know about. Uh, I, my question is the following. Very often uh, when I'm, uh, I'm a member of a jury in startup competitions and uh, the people uh, on the stage tell me that this is something that does not exist in the market. My first question to them is, well, maybe if it does not exist at all in the market, maybe it's not such a good idea. <laughs> so how do we tackle this issue? How do we, how do we uh, really uh, differentiate ourselves from the competitors, but at the same time, convincing the evaluators that we are not going to a direction on our own. We are part. We are trying to cover a need that many other people see, but we are covering it in a better way. Do you have some tricks or tips from your experience on that? I, I think being sure of your facts. First of all, as you say, it may not exist in the market because nobody wants it. So the first question is: Is there a need? Um, you know, can you identify a solid need for your uh, product? Now, I've sat with some companies who've shown me their world-beating idea, and I've used my smartphone to check on the web, and I've found products identical. So if companies don't even bother to research uh, to see if anyone else makes these things, they're wasting their time in bidding. Uh, often with a research background, your idea becomes your baby and it's yours and it's protected and there's nothing else like it in the world. Everybody's baby is the most attractive in the world, of course, uh, in the human world. So uh, identifying need, um, getting around a bit. I mean, I, I'm a great believer in it doesn't cost a huge amount when we can do it to go off to uh, an exhibition, look around, see what's happening. Uh, the Commission themselves run Innovation Days and the uh, Research and Innovation Days coming up. You can um, look and see what else people are doing, look around exhibitions uh, and see, you know, and talk about the need as well as looking at the solutions. So being sure of your facts in terms of the market and the uniqueness of your product. The uniqueness may be that it does a better job, it does a better job for uh, a lower price um, and you know, I, again, one company I went to, uh, they produced an item. There were only two other manufacturers in the world, one in Italy, one in America. Their product was about 25% of the cost, but they hadn't bothered pursuing it because they didn't think there was a market because these two other companies had the market. But if you can produce something as good or better at a quarter of the price, there is a market. So, you know, it's on price, quality, and uniqueness. Thank you very much, Philip. 
let's uh, uh, look a little bit uh, more in the other set of criteria. As we said, feasibility, feasibility is a very important uh, aspect, uh, but also another thing that we are always looking. And uh, this is a trick that I have seen. I don't know, Yasemi, maybe you have some experience with me as a reviewer. Sometimes it's obvious in a proposal that part one has been written by one person, part two has been written by another person, and part three has been written by another person. Yeah. It's fine if people do it, but uh, they need to somehow tell a coherent story, which take, takes us to the last point here, at, uh, uh, taken as a whole, at which extent excellence elements are coherent and plausible, meaning that the, the story needs to be solid and uh, connected. Uh, how do we achieve that? What do you think, Yasmin? Uh, I think uh, to prove that the product is feasible and uh, to prove the, uh, to the evaluators that there's a demand in the market, uh, close customer interaction is very important. So while they are telling that feasible or commercially feasible or practically feasible, uh, they should write and give about uh, the customer interaction during the development of the product. Because uh, the companies, especially the technology people, they first develop the product. And when it is finished, when it is ready, they take it to the car customer, they take it to the market, but then they... Uh, Software, they should open the beta version of the software and they should uh, make the potential customers try, use, and give them feedback. If it is a B2B product, they should take their product to the facility of the customer, they should test the product, and they should provide detailed information uh, from this uh, field test that the product is tested by the potential customer and it, it made the customer happy, it made it met their requirements, it is technically feasible and it's in line with customer needs, so it's economically feasible. Uh, I think this is the most important aspect in terms of proving that the product is feasible. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Uh, I would like now to take the opportunity to ask you a couple of questions more, if it's okay with you. Yes. So, let's go now to ask the participants. So, any other votes? Okay, we have technology readiness level nine. That's interesting. Okay. Let me then leave it for another second. Let us get a couple of answers more. Great. Please continue voting. I will move to the other one. Okay, here you can pick more than uh, one of the statements. Uh, do you have a working prototype? Do you have some initial customers? Do you already have a patent? Do you have already launched to the market? Sometimes you might have customers, but you're not really launching in the market in the sense that you have some test customers, and this is also a very good strategy. But sometimes people are putting even a product that is not 100% mature in the market exactly because they're expecting to get some kind of uh, customer feedback. <coughs> okay. We do have some answers there. Maybe a couple more would be good. And then for this, uh, this is the last part of the, of the questionnaire. What are the greatest risks you are facing? And please pick more than one if relevant. Let me see now, what do you consider as the biggest risk that your company is facing? 
So, are they technical, financial, related to your capacity to sell, related to your, uh, about your capacity to attract and retain talent, HR, related to your capacity to uh, some kind of patents or your ability to, to have patents or some other patents that are limiting your freedom to operate? These are the topics that we would like to see. Please look at your votes. Philip, I think it's the time now to get a question. Because what you will receive, what you will uh, uh, see here is that, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. What you will see here is that the majority of the risks are of various uh, topics. Financial is the first one, is the need for capital. But look at one category that nobody sees as a risk. Which is this one? I think this confirms your uh, your uh, uh, your. Uh... And we lost you. We can't hear you, Grigoris. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. I was asking. I was mentioning. Uh, for me, it's quite important that you will see there is one category with zero risks identified, and this is the yeah. technical. Yeah. In my opinion, this totally confirms your previous statement that in Turkey we normally start with an excellent technical background, we have a very solid technical team in place, and then we're trying to build the market. Whereas, for example, sometimes in Silicon Valley you see the totally opposite direction. You see that uh, some entrepreneur or someone with entrepreneurial skills gets into an idea and then he's trying to recruit the technical team to build the product. Yeah. Uh, so I think that this is a difference in the ecosystem, but I don't consider it as a disadvantage. On the contrary, I think that it, if you combine the, technic, the strong technical skills uh, and you try to use this project uh, in a way to improve the financial risk that we're facing and also the other things, it's quite important. One good, uh, one good trick that we use in proposals in the EIC Accelerator with respect to that is we are finding some of our competitors we are trying to convince the reviewers that these competitors are not as advanced as we are at the technical level. And then we are demonstrating how high tickets they have raised in the United States or in London or in Frankfurt from VCs. And then we're explaining the financial risk. We're explaining namely that we have a very limited uh, access to finance, which is uneven to our technical development capacity. Having said that, I, I think I think that it's contradictory. You can't have zero technical and have problems with competition and sales because the competition may have technical advantages. Uh, the same with sales. You can't have one without the other, I think. Um, quite often uh, we've seen projects which um, the management of the company have pursued the science and not the customer need. They've excited, become excited about the science. I have a wonderful example here in the UK. We, we bought a, a new electric fire recently, and it came with its own Samsung notebook to turn it on and off and to change the temperature. And they said, this is the only one in Europe that has this facility. Absolutely ridiculous. Two switches would have done the job, but you have a Samsung notebook, you have to keep charged, in order to turn an electric fire on and off. <laughs> you know, where do you go with that? It's innovation for the sake of innovation. Um, okay, we bought it because we wanted the fire, but the control I find crazy. But there's an example of people just pursuing science and technology without looking at customer need. It wasn't needed. Thank you very much, Philip. I think that based on that, I will now move to my next presentation. And here we are, this is section two. Ah, we have also some uh, questions. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's good to answer those questions now so that we, we uh, move as we go. Uh, while machine learning is included in the innovation trigger, could the project step by experiencing in order to predict that big data is a disillusionment? Well, if you have solid, uh, solid arguments to do that, uh, 
getting that, that deep into technical matters is something that uh, I think that the people with the technical background have a better view. Generally speaking, I would, uh, I would like to avoid very strong statements, saying that big data is a disillusionment is quite a strong statement. And if you come across a reviewer that is uh, coming from the big data uh, background, you might be um, in a way punished about that. You might say that there are other opportunities opening and so on and so forth. Uh, now, if, if there is any acceptable template to excellent plan and project uh, acceptance, this is for you, uh, Philip. Well, I think this is a question we get quite often. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a regular question. Is there a, is there a, a, a magic uh, pro forma we can use for a winning proposal? The answer is no. Uh, the only answer I would give is that you are giving it in the sense of your sharing experience uh, of what you find to be good, bad and indifferent about submitting proposals. It, it all goes into that. Um, and of course, there can't be a pro forma for this because every idea is different, every market's different, uh, every ways of presenting is different. So the Commission give really good guidance on their website on what they expect to see in these different sections and Gregorius is building on that with his and our experience. Um, so I would recommend looking at what the Commission have. If you look on our website, there's a guide to submitting a bid, which is about 30 pages long uh, and again gives indications of what the Commission expect. Um, but there is no magic formula, I'm afraid. Thank I wish you. there was. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for the answer. And now we are moving to the next part. And I hope you can all see my screen. Is it correct? Yeah, can see. Yes. So, market, market. Obviously speaking, we're talking about close to market products. So the best way to convince that you are close to market is to demonstrate how well you know the market. Uh, so here we're not talking about uh, describing just the market assessment, meaning just to depict the market as it is now, but always we are trying to uh, present our market as a growing market. As Philip said before, nobody would like to put their money into a market that is going to go down, that is going to be diminished later on. So, for example, if we want to explain our market uh, in, the, in, the, in the perspective of time, it's good to show how the market is going to grow, but it's also good to, to know the different segmentations within our market so that we understand that what is the cumulative growth rate within the sub-segments. Let me give you the example here. The proteins market in total, the, the meat market in total, let's say, would grow by 3% in the next uh, 15 or so years. But within this uh, market segment, the conventional meat will actually uh, uh, get smaller, it will go down, it will decline by 3%. The, uh, the plant-based replacement will go up by 9%, and the cultured meat, the lab-grown meat, is expected to grow by 41%. So sometimes, even if your market is growing at a rate which is not abnormal, it might be useful for you to demonstrate that you have a high growth rate within your subsector. And of course, then you need also to talk about customers, unique selling points, and differentiators. Let's go to those one by one. So, many of you will think that Tam Samsung is some kind of mad scientist from North Korea, but in reality, this is a framework that we use to understand the size of our market. So, TAM is the total available market, stands for total available market. And the example here is the total agricultural robotics market, like uh, we discussed before. The SAM is the serviceable addressable market, is that the market that uh, is, uh, is uh, representing the technology or the services that we are uh, uh, selling, we are producing. For example, the total market for spraying robots, the, the robots who are spraying pesticides on the field. This is our SAM. And then the SOM is the serviceable, obtainable market, is the part of this market that I can realistically address to. Obviously, there is a very good market in Australia about these topics, but I'm, I'm far away from Australia and there are other companies doing it there. Obviously, there might be a very good market there in China, but I cannot export to China for this matter. So, technically speaking, 
the shop, the serviceable, obtainable market is my realistic goal to sell the spraying robots to farmers. Which are the, the, the geographies, which are the places where I can really get in. Uh, Grigoris, may I raise a question here on behalf yes. of Parkinson? Because this is a question uh, I get very often and I'd like to hear your opinion as well. Uh, regarding these market figures, it's very important to give some numbers about their potential market size. You are right. But sometimes uh, it's hard to access to these figures, these statistics, you know, about the potential size of the market. And even if the product is very specific, it's even harder. So uh, what type of tools or uh, other uh, means are you, would you recommend? Do you think just Googling is enough or what, what they should do? Well, what we normally do is, of course, we try to find what studies exist. There are market research companies, but mm -hmm. the full report is very expensive. It can be yeah. up to $5,000, so possibly a startup does not have that budget. But nevertheless, most of them are giving, I would say, free samples of their work where the, uh, the information is there. And uh, they have quite specialized, even if your, if your product is very specialized, they have quite specialized uh, answers with respect to that. Now, uh, as a second step, if you have identified, this can help you to identify the total global available market because then these are US companies, they're looking at the global market, they have their own ways to do it. This is a way to find your global market. Uh, another uh, trick you may apply if you are aiming for the concrete markets. For example, let's suppose a Turkish company is looking at the market of Germany and the market of Italy. Your uh, embassies in uh, Germany and in Italy, they have commercial attaches, they have commercial uh, officials whose job is exactly to provide such data to companies. You, if you have time, you can contact them early on and they should be able to give you statistical data about the particular companies you are looking at, if they have and if, they are, if it's obtainable. Other tricks I have in mind about estimating the size of the market is by estimating a little bit the size of the uh, revenue of the main players. So, for example, if you know the revenues of Google and uh, Yahoo, uh, this is a, a simplified example, you more or less can estimate the market for search engines. Uh, these are some tricks that we use in the lack of data. Also, sometimes it's very good to, to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, estimate your market particularly the some part of the market, in the serviceable, obtainable market, through statistical data. If I'm selling something, let's say, to uh, one technology for uh, babies, I would estimate the number of babies born in one country uh, per year from the statistical data, and then pretty much I know that this is the whole range. Then if I use some other the statistical data to see uh, which of the parents are buying uh, high-tech uh, equipment uh, to help them in the parenting process, I can use this uh, information to understand a little bit what is the size of my market. Generally speaking, unfortunately, there is not one single source of information where you can get all the information about the market. It requires lots of research, but on the other hand, I must tell you, if you decide to devote your life in one idea, if you decide to, to put all the efforts and all the struggles in the product, I think it's a very important uh, priority also to collect such information all the time because the market changes, new ideas come across. So I am expecting, if I was a reviewer, I would expect to see very good data from the startups on this topic. I would expect that they would have the data from all different studies. Thank you. So that's an answer to that. The next one we're going to see is how do we present the market in terms of potential customers? Because sometimes it's very good to understand, according to the, to the market uh, segments, what also will be our strategy. So, for example, uh, if, we, if you can see in this table, we can uh, identify the market in terms of the countries. Then we can identify the market in terms of the size of the farms. And then we can identify the markets based on some other uh, aspects related to if they are uh, livestock farms or vegetable farms and so on and so forth. And then another important aspect, based on the segmentation, it's a good idea to try to fine tune our value position, our price policy, etc., to be able to uh, capture value from this particular market segment. 
So market segmentation is used not only to demonstrate to the evaluators we know our market, but it's also done in order to demonstrate that we are able to adjust the other ML elements of our business models, strategy, measures, uh, pricing, based on that. Now, here we have always this discussion with Philip, so I will invite him to join me. Uh, it's about the unique selling point. And uh, as the English word says, the unique selling point is supposed to be unique. This is the one thing that will make your cust the customers buy from you. Your, uh, your product might have many advantages. And in this, in this uh, uh, spider web diagram that you see here, you see how we, we explain many of the advantages. But sometimes there is one unique value proposition. And the unique value proposition is supposed to be one. In this topic here, uh, my colleague who wrote this proposal wrote four of them. And uh, we don't always agree on that. Possibly you need to find the one that is the most striking. And, uh, what would be the criteria? Philip, let's suppose that one company has four advantages. Which one? How, how we should pick up the one to promote as a unique value proposition? Well, of course, the simple answer is the one that's truly unique. But um, if you've done your uh, customer research properly and you've analysed needs um, and you come up with an idea that it's the sort of wow idea, the wow factor, uh, you know, what a solution, what an excellent idea that is. And of course, people usually say, so why did nobody think of that before? Um, then, you know, you've got a winner. But... Um, that's easy enough when it's a fairly simple to understand and there is some wow attached to it. But when you say developed a new way of processing data through uh, electronic chip or something, that's much more difficult to get the wow factor over. So rather than trying to wow technically, um, you have to wow in the sense of time saved or processing time and even quoting, you know, microseconds, milliseconds, whatever, nanoseconds, um, in terms of processing time, it's not that impressive. So in that case, I'd give an example of where if this was installed in a computer, say, it would boost, I don't know, the number of, the number of items Amazon can process, um, the number of passengers you can get through airports, whenever that happens again. If you can relate something that people can understand, um, then it's more impressive. It brings in the wow factor. But uh, remember that the people looking at the bids, uh, some will inevitably be technical, but most will be business people. And they're wanting to be impressed. They're wanting to say, wow. They're wanting to say, I saw this idea today and it was fantastic. It really worth backing. Um, so there you are. The uniqueness, it's down to testing the market and demonstrating that it's unique because no one else has done it. Uh, and it's unique enough to be significant. So producing a pen in a different colour is not significant. It might be unique, but something which just isn't on the market or replaces it. I mean, the mobile phone's an example where, you know, it takes photos. It's a personal communicator. And in fact, people buy phones now, not really to make calls, but to do everything else. Searches on the internet, take pictures, text, and so on. Um, you know, it's a, it's a communicator. So no simple answer, but the market shows its uniqueness. So test the market will be my answer. Thank you very much. Now, let's talk a little bit about the commercialization strategy. What are the steps that we are taking in order to put our product or our service directly in the market? It is, uh, has to address, of course, our strategy as a company, but also the framework that is created by government or regulatory uh, organizations with respect to approvals or compliance as needed. Uh, the time to market, how much time we need from the day that we have the fine tuned product according to customer specification until the time that we're going to deliver it to the customers. And of course, the revenue model, which is a simple, uh, in simple terms, is how we're going to make money for us, for our company because that's also something they want to see. They want to build profitable companies that will yield high returns to their founders. So the commercialization strategy. Generally speaking, there are different elements of the commercialization strategy, and I use this example to highlight them. One is the time. By time, I mean the evolution of an idea uh, and the various prototypes until you reach operational conditions and until you reach commercial conditions. 
Uh, in this aspect, you need also to identify the different stages of development that you are doing. And then you have to explain also the capital sources, how, where you are financing them, and where do you expect the re revenues to come from. It's a good idea, as you see here, uh, that uh, this can be depicted also in the, in the analytical framework of technology readiness levels, to see how we're moving until one technology readiness level, but still, and this is something that we learned from the Japanese about the continuous improvement, that even if you reach a technology readiness level nine, you just don't step back and enjoy and wait for the product to sell. You continuously try to improve the product. You are all the time getting feedback from the customers. You are all the time measuring the performance of different aspects of your product in order to bring the value, more value to the customer, even if your product is already launched in the market. So these are the things that people need to understand. And, and also it's important in your commercialization strategy to be able to identify the different steps and to demonstrate that your strategy is adjusted to each step. For example, if we are, uh, we are uh, uh, developing some uh, technology that has lots of trade secrets, that has lots of interesting things that our competitors might like to copy, etc., we might want to go into stealth mode up to a point. But if you're going and asking for, uh, for investors to finance your uh, Series A or to give you a big ticket, and you're telling them you're on stealth mode, that's why nobody knows about you, that's not a good strategy. So, the strategy needs to be adjusted according to the timing and we need to be able to demonstrate that in different uh, uh, stages of maturity of the product, uh, when it comes to its commercialization, we apply different strategies. Revenue model, how we're going to make money. Revenue model is uh, practically, you have the typical revenue model, for example, from the software, that is like services, products, subscription, uh, buying licenses, etc. But what happens when we have hardware? There, the revenue models might be a little bit more complicated. Of course, the obvious revenue model is to sell the hardware per se. But nowadays, when they we're going for hardware, which is more uh, uh, related to tech, to technological uh, uh, advancements, we see some more clever business models. One is the so-called hardware as a service. And there is this company acquired by Cisco, Meraki. I think Meraki is a Turkish word, am I right? And uh, these guys are uh, selling the device, but the device is working uh, only when a recurring fee is paid. So practically, you are buying both the device, but you are buying, let's say, the right to operate the device on a monthly basis. Then you might have this model in a, light, in a more mild, I would say, way. Because you, are, you have the option to buy the, the hardware, but at the same time, if you want to buy services on the top of your hardware, this is optional. And last but not least, uh, you have the, the, the possibility to buy the uh, hardware, but you actually buy the hardware in a cost which is in a way lower than it should be, so it's kind of subsidized by the, by the company, who is then going to sell you the consumables. One good example for this is the Kindle uh, book, uh, because the Amazon is practically sending the Kindle hardware barely at the cost, but it's only constantly from selling the content afterward. Some might say that the Nespresso machines are also moving along this direction. Now, when it comes to external strategic partners, these are the partners that will be required to develop and commercialize your innovation. Uh, in the modern, uh, current uh, uh, business environment, nobody works alone. The network with strategic partners, the collaborations, the value that is brought to you by working with the best is what will convince them. Here you can see, for example, that this company is explaining very well what they are producing themselves. And then they say, for the cloud service, we are based on Microsoft Azure. For the traceability of blockchain, we're based on origin trade. So practically, they are explaining how their own products and their own capacities are uh, complemented by, by, uh, by uh, very high-level partners. So then the question is, what are the roles and the competence of partners? And to which extent they have already been committed and incentivized with this respect? So if you have a prior uh, collaboration, particularly with some big name, it's very, very important to put them forward. And also from your partners, but also from investors or from uh, big customers, it's very important to collect letters of intent and put them in your own extreme. 
These, of course, need to be from relevant organizations. Don't collect a letter of intent for any budget you know. Also, don't be tempted to make one standard template for letters of intent and collect 20 of those. You need to have a little bit in your letter of intent, you need to have a little bit of, I would say, uh, customization to make the re letter relevant and explain to the people, uh, to add paragraphs that are explaining the concrete collaboration you have. And of course, it's important that they are signed by the decision makers, not some junior administrative personnel. So, the idea is for your strategic customers, investors, uh, strategic collaborators, uh, partners, uh, uh, uh, universities that were collaborating, whatever, try to collect letters of intent, MOUs, whatever documents you can uh, use, scan them and put the scanned copies in Annex 3. It's very important to have. Intellectual property. We noticed before that some of you, some of the participants already have a patent. Uh, here, what is important is to specify the intellectual property rights related to the innovation, but also to find what other patents exist and who owns them, but also what is more important. Try to uh, ensure your freedom to operate. Try to convince the reviewers that despite the patents, you are not violating of any of the existing patents and you have the freedom to operate in the topic of your innovation. That's very important because we have seen, for example, proposals that are perfect. They are claiming that they are going to put US as the target market. And in the target market of US, there is already a patent covering exactly what they're doing, meaning that then when they're going to arrive there, they would either have to buy the patent to become uh, owners of it, or they will be blocked from entrance. And now a very important element uh, with respect to the scale-up potential. You need here to explain how you are going to become from a startup to a scale-up, and you need to explain that with respect to developing new markets, with respect to the impact of the innovation of the growth of the company, and so on. I would like to refresh your memory on what Philip said. In play terms, scale-up potential or scalability is your ability to earn more as you grow, to get more than you put in as you grow. The, the growth part is important. Here you can see, for example, uh, the scale-up potential with respect to the size of the market, with respect to the new market that they are aiming, with respect to the strategy and the pricing policy they're going to apply to, to reach those markets. So practically, they are preparing, uh, they are uh, uh, presenting a full uh, picture of how the scale-up should look like, how the scale-up potential can be convincing with respect to new markets, with respect to pricing policy and uh, other business uh, elements that they take into account. And one important thing is, what will be the impact in the growth of the company? The impact in terms of employment. Remember, all these programs have the employment as one of their uh, impact uh, indicators always. Uh, revenues, market share, and new opportunities for the market. A good way to present that is to present basis, based on these elements, to present what is your current situation and what will be the situation after the implementation of your project in terms of how your market share is going to grow, how your customer base is going to grow both inside the country and outside the country, how your employment is going to grow, of course, and some elements related to your potential turnover and uh, uh, increase. You see here the key performance indicators, and here we're talking about key performance indicators which are related to the success criteria for the innovation technological, practical, economic, etc. But also, it's very important to explain the target values, and the, uh, but not only that, but when these target values are going to happen. For example, one good point to, to look at the target values is the break-even point. And since we're talking about the break-even point, we will have a, a slide for that in the next uh, uh, part of the presentation. And then you go to the broader impact, Nowadays, in business, it's not enough to make money. You need to convince that the, the company has some kind of uh, uh, broader impact which is related to societal, economic, or environmental, or climate issues, and what would happen if our innovation is successfully commercialized. 
We live in the days of the Green Deal. The whole, as, as Philip mentioned earlier, the whole Europe now is under the Green Deal agenda, is under the Green Deal policy, uh, which means that uh, we are pushing, and there was a specific call for the Green Deal, we are trying to push as much as possible that the, the innovations that will be put forward in the market will also have a positive impact on climate change, a positive impact on the environment, and a positive impact on the quality of the life of the citizens. So this is an important uh, aspect that we need to take into account. Arriving to that, we have now to uh, sum up with the criteria. First question going to Yasemin. Yasemin, yes. what, uh, can you give us a, a, a couple of tips or tricks in terms of demonstrating that there is a substantial demand about the product, product that we're selling, and not only demand, but also, most important, willingness to pay. Many people have demand. The point is who is ready to put their hand in the pocket. Can you please have some information about that? How do you see successful proposals at Civic uh, It depends on your business model, actually. If you, are, uh, if you have a B2C business model, uh, for example, I, I gave the example before, if you have a software targeting uh, customers and users, and uh, then you should, uh, you should have a beta test before, and you should uh, mention about your traction numbers in your proposal. You should well define, our beta is open since this date, and we have this, this, this number of uh, users or this type of downloads, free downloads uh, from this market. If, if you have international customers, it, it is even better. Uh, so you should define uh, your traction numbers uh, for software products. If you have a hardware or software, but it is B2B, then you should uh, definitely uh, meet your potential customers. You should make them try and test your product and uh, if possible, you should get some network intent uh, from your potential customers. These letters are non-binding letters. Uh, they, don't have, they don't have to commit that they will buy your product, but it should be uh, explained in the letter that uh, the customer, the potential customer has already tested your product, compared it with the alternative solutions and your product has really high performance and if it is on the market, they will be willing to buy your product. So these type of letters are very important. If you get these letters from big customers, from reputable international customers, of course, it will increase your chance of uh, winning the grants. Thank you very much. I think that was very detailed. Uh, Phil, scale up attention. I think the most critical possible point. So I would like to ask you, if possible, if the connection is good, uh, how can we connect the uh, scale up potential with the financial needs? Because we have noticed in the past, I remember from our discussions, that sometimes people are they, they are trying to be very careful not to ask for big budgets and this and that. But this actually undermines the potential to scale up. So what is the what is your idea about that? Well, the, the, the feedback we get um, from the Commission is that um, often companies are reluctant to put realistic figures in. I mean, some obviously uh, go over the top, but uh, in terms of the Commission's investment, uh, they want to see that the company have asked enough to see it through to success, to get over the risk, get into the market, and so on. So companies shouldn't be too shy about asking for, uh, for cash. And of course, in Turkey, costs are perhaps lower or are lower than other countries. So um, explaining what's needed um, is very important and being realistic about it in terms of the amount of time it will take to realize profit. So all I would say is be realistic, be sensible about what you're asking for and don't be too shy. Thanks a lot. I think that's a very critical comment. Uh, again, we need to remember also that uh, our uh, this part needs to be again very well aligned with the strategic uh, overall strategy of our company and how this particular innovation will fit into the overall 
uh, strategy of our company. Now, uh, just uh, just yeah. to add on that one, we, we've not mentioned this, Gregorius. Um, if you don't have a strategy, you don't have a future. I think absolutely vital that you sit down and you have a sort of five-year horizon where you say, where do we want to be in five years? Do you want to be a multi-million pound international business? Do you want to stay as a two or three man family business? Where do you want to be? And I think just having a thought about that, you might just do a one pager that says in five years time, we see ourselves as, and then within that five year plan to have a more detailed one year plan for each year. So your five year plan is rolling. It moves ahead a year every year. It may change. I mean, things like coronavirus come along and economic problems and all of those things, it can change. But at least you have, uh, you know, you wouldn't set out on a journey without looking at a map. So you need to know the destination. And then the one year plan is your your map, your sat nav, ideally, um, where you set out how you're going to achieve the first year of that. That itself may change. So you may need to meet monthly, quarterly and discuss the plan, change it, see how it's going. But it's much more comfortable for the management and the employees to know that there is a destination and that you are getting there, or at least you're thinking of how you may get there despite changes. And the simple business plan is, where are you now? Where are you going? How will you get there? And I suggest every company needs that. Indeed, and possibly this is one of the collateral benefits of getting into writing a proposal because as you see, success rates might be low, but the value you are getting through this process might be beyond this particular call. Yeah. Now, uh, do we have any questions that we need to answer or should I go to our poll? They've been answered as we've gone along, but people yeah. cannot answer them. You are amazing. Let me go then to the polls. And then the next question that we have is, first of all, to the participants. Have you performed already a detailed analysis uh, of your market, your target markets? By collecting data, by talking to customers, by going to the statistical services, by finding uh, a market uh, research available on the web, etc. Let's give you a little bit how we're doing with that. So far, I think that we're still in the process. Okay, that's positive because I have news for you. No matter how detailed your mar target market analysis would be, you will always need to be in the process. This is not a situation that finishes. Uh, every day you need to continue collecting data. Possibly the thing that you need to organize and make it systematic is a, a process of constantly collecting data about your target market because this is supposed to be your, uh, your main job when you want to launch products. Let me see a few more votes. It's a pity that we don't have a live event. I would like to ask you much more questions and I would like to pick up your, uh, your reactions during the presentation, but it is what it is and we're learning to live with that. Let me see a couple of more. So, Good thing is that the majority of the participants are either have done already detailed analysis of target markets or they are in the process. Let me see now. Philip, do you have a just, comment on that? Just, no, just one point on that. We're in the process of performing it. Now that can mean we thought about it a couple of weeks ago and we've done nothing since, or we're actively investigating before we take our project further. And I would much prefer the second to the first. You need to look at the market before you go much further. Okay, that's a very valid comment. Now, let's see a little bit of what you are offering here. That's a question that I'm always curious. Are you selling a physical product? Are you selling a software? Are you selling a service or a combination? That's, that's something that I'm really curious uh, when it comes to audiences because I don't have the chance to learn more about your ideas. Okay, I see that. Let me see how many. Okay. 
Turkey. I think that the majority of the people in this group are, are working on something which is a combination of services, physical products and software. Which is good. It means that you can have uh, different revenue streams. It's also interesting. Okay, let's move to the next one. Now, how are you protecting uh, your IP? Do you already have a patent? Are you in the process of obtaining a patent or your uh, innovation is not patentable at all? Okay, the good, some, some of the participants already have a patent, that's really important. And many are out there in the process of obtaining a patent. Still, and it makes sense, particularly in the service domain or in, in the software domain, in parts outside Europe, it's not really so easy, uh, Philip, that you know, to, to get a patent. Just um, a point on patenting. People presume that because they have a patent, they are protected against copying. They are. But to pursue that, you have to be able to take the offender to court to deal with the law of the country that you're claiming in. And you have to have the finance and be able to afford the time. It can take years. So if the Chinese copy your invention, to quote one country, you'd have to pursue that in China through their courts to get satisfaction. The simple question I have is, as SMEs, can you afford either the time or the money to do that? Now, patents very important, of course, if you're selling into a national market or European market, but the global market, it can be very difficult, uh, in the Far East particularly, and um, I would say that the effort is best put in getting your novel idea into the market and winning market share than to spend weeks, months, years uh, trying to fight a patent that you have no chance of winning because meanwhile the copyist is selling and making profit from your idea. So it's in their interest to delay it and patent lawyers cost a lot of money. Oh, very interesting uh, element and indeed it's tricky for uh, small companies to, to bear with all these legal costs. I have experienced it myself in my own company once. And uh, what do you believe that the, the broader impact of your innovation is? And you, are, uh, you can choose more than one. Is it about more jobs? Is it about environmental? Is it about social benefits? Is it about other types of benefits? So, let me see a little bit your reactions over there. It seems that more jobs is the most valid, and it makes sense. I'm happy also to see that the environmental benefits are quite high because, as I told you, we are living in the times of the of the Green Deal, and uh, everything needs to be green these days. Uh, but it's also a good uh, good aspect because we are also need to take some urgent action with respect to environment. Okay. I will now stop sharing my screen in this presentation. There is a question. Uh... Oh, thank you very much. It's a warm message. Thank you. And let us now move to the other presentation. Which is the last part of our discussion and this one has to do with the implementation part. So, I will share my screen with that. So here we go. I hope you can all see my screen. It's 
No, it's not this one. Apologies, it's this one, yes. Here we go. First topic, team. And here we have the famous quote. Uh, people know that uh, Steve Jobs had many famous quotes. This one is one of my favorites. It's about the team, the definition of a perfect team. And he's using the example of the Beatles, the rock and roll band from UK. Uh, I think they were popular at your times, uh, Philip. Am I right? Uh, so the, the thing here my, is that... My, my father used to tell me about them. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, the point here is that the perfect team is the team where uh, the balance is and that the sum of the capacities and the skills of each of the person, when you sum it up, it's greater than if you have each one of them individually. This is the, the, the things that the one single person can never do, but the team can certainly do. So here you need to explain the team, the different roles and the commitment of the team, the achievements, experience, uh, and uh, how this connect to the innovation. What is the role of the owner, of the, of the founder? How the, the shareholding and stock options of team members, including owners, are split? The strengths and the weaknesses of the team? The plans to acquire currently missing competencies and the incentives of team members? Moving from that, one important thing is the roles and commitment. Here, you need to identify the team members, their positions, the department, and another thing about commitment. What are the key people of the company, like the CEO and the CTO? Anything less than 100% of the full commitment is not allowed. The panel of reviewers mostly includes investors and mostly includes people with experience in business. So you are asking the taxpayers to finance something and you are not even ready to commit 100% of your own time on it. That's what they will tell you. Because they are trying to find something that will have huge success. So at least for the main, main technical leading roles, you need to have the people who are going to be there. Who are going to be there 100%, if not 120%. Let's see now an example. And of course, you don't need to be Ben Horowitz to win a, a, uh, this type of uh, position, but let's see an example of how we explain the achievement and experience. So, if you go from the back to the end, this guy who is now, uh, for those of you who don't know, Ben Horowitz is one of the most famous venture capitalists in, uh, in uh, the United States, in Silicon Valley. And he's explaining how he started being a technical lead, a senior product marketing positions, how then he became a vice president of Netscape, how from there he moved to another company that he managed to sell, how from there he was co-founder and CEO of another company, and before that, how he created uh, his uh, other aspects of the, his companies, how he became an investor, and after that, how he became also an impact investor, because he's trying to invest in vulnerable parts of the community. So, the bottom line is, if you're presenting your story, make sure that what you are presenting is relevant to the current innovation and that you are telling a story of constant advancement, of constant development. You're telling a story of moving upwards the, the corporate ladder, that you're making a story of you being able to put yourself out of your comfort zone and assume better and better roles in every uh, position. And also try to find unity with the position you are assuming. So, if you want to, uh, to appoint someone as a CTO, it, what you need to, to demonstrate is his or her technical achievements, the technical advancements that they made, and stuff like that. Then, let's go about how this should be split. Uh, typically, in, uh, you are expecting to have a good chunk of the, of the of ownership to be on the CEOs of the founders and the co-founders, you expect the key people in your company, and this is one of the incentives that we're going to see elsewhere. You expect the key people in your company to be properly incentivized, and by incentivized, I mean having shares in the company. And last but not least, you need to keep a slice, and this slice would be the so-called option pool. What is the option pool? Option pool is some shares that you keep aside for the new talent you are going to hire. So let's suppose that your company goes very well and you are now ready to launch the United States and you're looking for a, a sales director, a, a vice president of sales, however you want to call him, for the American market. 
you are looking for someone senior who is earning already a lot of money in his job, who knows the market, who knows his way, and so on and so forth. How are you going to incentivize this person? Sometimes salary is not enough. That's why you are keeping the option pool, and this is a part of the sales that you are going to share with people who are uh, required for your team and you don't have the uh, capacity to bring them on board only with monetary uh, reward. So normally, let's see a little bit the, how you, the, the uh, rate. Uh, what we expect to see is that the founding CEO uh, should have a, a 30 to 60%. You might have some active founding scientists, and this might be your CTO, or you may call them chief scientists or whatever. And then they should be having a very good uh, uh, percentage themselves because they are the technical cornerstones and the foundations of the company. And then you have the so-called passive founding scientist. This is the people who possibly helped in the beginning to kickstart the company. This might be a professor that was the, your boss in the lab when you established the idea, and you want to put them in the advisory board. These people should have shares, but these shares should not be above 5% by any means, since they are not involved on the day-to-day -to -day operation. And then you have other people, and you see here, you see some industry standards. This is, this is not carved in stone, don't take it for granted. This is just, uh, we are depicting here what happens in the market, what are the typical market conditions for that. But another thing that they're requesting with respect to your team is realistic estimation of strengths, weaknesses, and missing competencies. Here, it's important to identify your strengths. It's important to be able to identify what are the things that are strong in your team, but also what you are missing. And what you are missing, you need to have ambitious plans to cover these gaps. Meaning that you, once you get the funding, you, the first thing you should do is to try to recruit new talent. And this should be evident. This should be very well explained in your proposal. Now, let's talk a little bit about the incentives. Uh, obviously, there are the financial incentives, uh, salaries, stock options, bonus based on targets, and bonus is a very good way to motivate against salespeople. Also, some other financial incentives that they're giving sometimes coupons or whatever. But many people say that money doesn't bring happiness. So, uh, there are no financial incentives that might be very important for people. Uh, flexible working hours, uh, possibility to travel, to have trainings, to have workshops, team building activities like barbecues or uh, joint sport activities. Sometimes, again, for salespeople, what is very important is a company car. The environment is very important, but also, guys, it's very important working for a purpose. If you are aiming to attract talent from the younger generations or the millennials, it turns out that working for a purpose is very, very important aspect. So that's why your mission needs to be very well defined and the people to know what they're working for or other non-financial incentives you might come up with. Here at this point, I would like to make a break and ask my colleagues, both Yasemin, but also Philip, if you have, what is the status normally in the Turkish companies with respect to the structure with the ownership, something like that? What do you see when you're visiting the companies? What is, how are the percentages split? Um, I, I would say, and Yasmin can uh, comment, that the majority of teams we see are excellent scientists and engineers, um, very well qualified, um, but they have very little commercial experience or knowledge. Um, and for commercial, I mean financial and market. Um, and because the team doesn't have that aspect, they tend not to see it as well. They tend to think if there's something which is technically excellent, it will automatically win markets. Um, and even in some of the proposal I've looked at, um, we tend to be very proud of our achievements. So you have people with lots and lots of uh, academic qualifications um, and projects you've worked on that were high technology, but all of that does okay, it shows how clever you are as a team, but the more you talk about how clever you are, the more it's evident that you don't have 
the other factors like commercial and marketing experience. So it comes over as a high technical team who are academic, but would it stand a chance as a business? That's the question that they will be asking. So you're always looking for the balance. Yes, you need technical people. You also need the market and commercial experience um, and you also need a good chief executive who balances that out and is the leader. Um, there's this expression you use a lot, Gregoris, people look at the rider, not the horse. Uh, and it's very important, you know, that you get that message over. Do you have anything to add to that, Yasmin? Uh, no, I think I totally agree with you. They are most established by a couple of uh, engineers, not many, but one or two most of the time. And uh, I don't see this type of uh, different uh, people like uh, VCs or I mean the, the shares are mostly acquired and owned by the founders. Uh, what I see in the Turkish companies is that they are a bit hesitant to give shares to outsiders, you know. They would like to keep the shares for themselves. Of course, there are exceptions for those companies who got VC funding or who got funding from the angels. Uh, but most of the time, most of the time, they prefer, they tend to keep the uh, the founders keep the shares for themselves. That's what I see. If I could just add to that too, when it comes to um, proceeding with the project, uh, we've said to companies, so if you're successful, what will you do? Oh, we'll make it. Now these are researchers with limited funds who've had a really good idea. Um, to make it, um, you know, you need to build a factory, you need to have manufacturing knowledge, you need to know about manufacturing techniques to get the design right, uh, final design right. Um, and often they don't consider working in partnership, working under license, or even selling the idea. Um, you know, it's their baby, as I said earlier, it's their baby, and they want to see it through to maturity and won't listen to uh, other alternatives. I think you have to be realistic about your company, what it does, how it does it, and then decide accordingly. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, now, we're getting into the financials. Uh, this is a highly technical aspect that you will certainly need help from your accountant. I will go very quickly through the tables, but I would like also to encourage you, as we mentioned uh, in the beginning, we have, uh, we have uh, organized a particular training course on financials. It was a webinar that was uh, delivered uh, early this week, and it's already available in YouTube, in our uh, channel in YouTube. So I would go very quickly through those to keep some time for successful cases, and I will, uh, I will uh, suggest you to watch the, the YouTube video uh, dedicated on financials and also advise, get advice from your, from your uh, accountant. So, Practically speaking, first of all, a little bit of theory uh, when it comes to break-even point, because this is a very, very important aspect in your uh, whole financial planning. So, in plain terms, break-even point is the time that we stop losing money from the business. Break-even point is the time that the sales that we are making are able at least to be in the same level as our costs. And by cost, we mean both the fixed costs, which are stable, like our rent, our uh, uh, uh, some expenses which are flat, but also the variable costs. The costs were changing according to the uh, to the level of activity, to the volume of sales. So this is very important aspect because break-even point is the point from which we start making profit, and this is very important in our financial projection because one of the main tables that you will need to fill in with the support of your accountant is the first of all the financial performance of the company for the past two years and then the projections for the upcoming five or six years in these six years it's also important to identify one point that you will reach the break even point you don't need to make profit from day one on the contrary you're supposed to have a losses in the first years of your company exactly because we're developing technologies which are not uh, broadly accepted in the market, but in your forecast at one point after the first couple of years or towards the end, you need to see that you reach the break-even point and then you have some very strong profits. These are also some financial ratios that you need to calculate, they're automatically calculated based on the previous answer that you will give. Again, this is something that your accountant will be able to help you. Then here you need to explain a little bit uh, 
what we call the runaway. The runaway is the time you have to survive with the money you have in the, in the, in the account of the company. So this means that if you are having like, let's say 10,000 euros in your account and you are burning 1,000 per month, your survival time is one year, is 10 months. After the 10 months, actually before the 10 months, you have already to start thinking where you're going to get some extra money. Are you have, do you have savings to put yourself as equity? Do you have friends and families who are ready to support? Are you talking to VCs or business angels? Are you supplying, uh, are you submitting proposals for grants? Are you selling products and you're expecting some money from the customers? One way or another, you need to gather some money to survive. Then it's good here to identify how the financing history of your company has been so far, meaning how you're going to, uh, how did you put equity yourself or who did you put equity? If you have some loans or some other types of debts, if you obtain some grants, please be very accurate with that. And particularly if you may have grants, please make sure you highlight them because they're very, very important for your, uh, for, for showing that you have already achieved something with respect to technology development as well, because we're looking for finalized prototypes in this course. Now, again, I have discussed about this uh, table. Here you are supposed to explain the ownership in the capital structure. And then you need to explain the current financing ground, how much money you need if you are also raising equity and what will be your post money valuation. Actually, what will be the value of the company after you raise all the money you're planning to raise. These are some questions related to the blended finance option. Remember, blended finance is an equity investment coming on behalf of the European Commission if you want to pursue other activities that go at the technology readiness level of nine. And here, some important aspects is how the equity component will be used and how much equity are you ready to share with the European Commission fund for this, uh, how the valuation of the company is uh, developing and what are relevant metrics and milestones, why the company owners, how is the company owners in the capital structure? We've seen this table before. And the most important, every investor has one uh, thing that they have in their mind, the exit. How they're going to sell the part of the company that they invested with you to someone else for more money. So they earn money and they move to their next investment. So here you need to explain what is your expected exit and what would be the assumption that you made with respect to that. Now, we're going possibly to the most uh, important topic about the EIC support. And this is the non-bankability. What you have to do here is you need to prove uh, to the reviewers that, you've, uh, yeah, that your project is non-bankable, but non-bankable for the right reasons. This, uh, we explain this in detail in the webinar about the financials, but I will go quickly through it. There is a problem in the European market for uh, financing startups and SMEs because the VC in Europe is quite small, it's fragmented, and it has a short-term view. They don't understand uh, deep tech, they don't understand science and technology. The majority of the VCs, they're looking to finance some app that is delivering food or some app that is uh, booking uh, hotels and uh, and they're playing tickets. Don't get me wrong. These are all great companies. They're making lots of money and they're making our life easier. But in Europe, we need more deep tech investment. And because of that, the current VC market is a little bit mm, so and so. Then, banks. Banks are super conservative. Uh, there is the old uh, uh, quote that uh, banks are financing only the people who don't need their financing. Because they, they will be looking, if you have assets, they will be looking if you have collateral, they will be looking if you have a huge cash flow, and obviously startups don't have these things. And when it comes to grants, the grants are sometimes either too small or they're coming a little bit too late because they have lengthy bureaucratic procedures or the budgets are enough possibly to build the prototype, but not enough to go from the prototype to the scale up. And this is where the AC accelerator comes in. The projects they are looking to finance have to have a very strong deep tech element which makes them too risky possibly for uh, typical investors or for banks or for the public grant. Therefore, and it's good here that you, if you can use relevant uh, facts and data from Turkey, and there it's very, very important also to demonstrate uh, that you have, uh, that you are doing efforts for VCs. And one killing thing if you manage to achieve would be 
to bring in some letters of support from VCs, from investors, telling that if they're going, that if you're going to win the grant, they're going to co-find. I think that this is a very, very strong point in, the proposal, in your proposal. So, I will now have two questions, one for Yasemin and one for you. Yasemin, your question is related to the Turkish landscape. How is the investment? How are the VCs are acting? If you know about any big investment from private investors that happened recently in the tech domain and so on. And then I will pass it to Philip for his question, which will be related of the tips and the tricks. How can we get a letter of support from VCs? Because I think that there are some ideas there as well. But first, Yasemin, how's the landscape in Turkey with respect to VCs? Uh, I think in the last uh, three, four years, the private investment landscape has improved dramatically compared to, uh, I mean, if you compare it to Europe or to US, of course, it is still very, very minimum, at minimum. Uh, but compared to what we had for five years ago, I think it's improved. Uh, first of all, there are some angels. If, if, if the company or an entrepreneur is looking for the seed investment, there are business angel networks. And uh, if the companies are looking for a uh, bigger amount of investment, around 1, 2 million USD or Euro, there are also uh, a couple of uh, good working VCs and they have been uh, quite good acquisitions of the technology, Turkish technology companies by some uh, international VCs. There are also some Turkish VCs that are also supported by uh, Tvitak. There was a... a Twitter uh, funding program, which had made some investments into five VCs. So, I mean, the ecosystem is improving. Uh, although compared to Europe, it is still very, very uh, little amount. Uh, but what I, I would recommend to the entrepreneurs is that even if they are not looking uh, seriously for the VC investment, I think they should uh, always be in touch with the VCs in Turkey. They should uh, keep their contacts warm with them. Uh, they should present their idea to them. They should get their feedback because uh, it is very important if they are planning to apply to accelerator. The application process to accelerator is very similar to the application process to a VC. So if they uh, uh, pitch to VCs, if they uh, present their ideas to VCs and get their feedback, I think uh, they will they uh, more experienced when they apply to the accelerator program. It's very similar. So even if there are uh, not many VCs, there are some, there are some, and they are making quite good investments. So uh, it's not that bad, I would say. Thank you very much. And Philip, what is a way to, to put in um, X3 some good uh, uh, documents that will convince the reviewers that we are working in this towards the direction of this? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, two things there, just adding to what Yasmin said. Um, quite often when we visit companies, it's the first time anyone has uh, put a second pair of eyes on the company and the project and ask some difficult questions because um, as a team, the team have convinced themselves they have a winning idea that's going to make a fortune. Their friends, of course, wouldn't offend them and have said the same. Their family all think that their children are the best in the world and wouldn't really argue. And it's only when an external pair of eyes um, starts to look and ask questions that reality begins to dawn. So I would say if you have anyone independent that can simply listen to your idea and come up with a few questions and comments, um, the point you made, Gregorius, earlier about different sections being written by different people, even the proposal sometimes is contradictory in what it says because someone hasn't married up what everybody's saying in terms of percentages, numbers and so forth. Um, it hasn't had that final view. So using external help to look, uh, even to hire a consultant for a day or something to go through and talk about it and uh, put you through the test that you will get if you go to the evaluation uh, board. In terms of endorsements, I think three levels. One is um, always from uh, a senior person in a well-known company, it helps. So the first one is that they think it's a brilliant idea and they intend buying it and the rate they would buy it is probably going to be 
X um, million euros a year or something. That would raise questions about whether the company can meet that demand, of course, which have to be satisfied. The second would be to endorse the product in principle without committing to buying, but to say, you know, you can see that there's a market and it has great potential. And the third one would be to simply endorse the company as an excellent business that produces good things, um, you know, and you could uh, trust them to develop innovative ideas. So three levels. The first one, the most important, somebody important in a well-known company saying that they will buy uh, rare to get. Um, you can always draft the letter that you want from them and send it to them on the basis that you know they're very busy people. Here's a draft of what you would like. And nine times out of 10, they'll use that draft, perhaps take some commitment out of it. Um, so I think that's the response. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And now the, the question happens that you, we have to ask to the, we have to answer. Could, could you move closer to the microphone, Grigoris? I tend to lose you when you go back. That's it, thank you, sorry. Uh, the, now the big uh, question that we have to answer in our uh, proposal is, what will happen if we don't receive an answer support from the IC So, probably we will drop and we will get job. This is not a good idea. The best way to show is that you are committed to that. And uh, the best way to demonstrate that is, in case possibly you will be able to create a little bit of the so-called fear of missing out with respect to brain drain. The best possibility might be for you to actually uh, tell them that you're going to the States to raise capital, because that's true. Remember, at one point you said, when you compare you with your competitors to see the size of the rounds that you have uh, been able to raise. Now, going to the project risks, which you need again to, to apply, it's very important here not only to mention the risks of the project, but you also to mention the proposed mitigation measures, but also to identify a little bit the, the, uh, the work packages in your proposal that are going to be involved into that. And now we're going to the approach. It's very important in the overall structure and approach to present the timing of your work packages, uh, the so-called Gantt uh, chart, uh, to be able to fill in this table. Keep in mind that the, for technology readiness level my uh, activities, you need to go to, to get the funding from uh, the equity scheme, from the, from the uh, blended finance uh, scheme. Try not to have more than work, five work packages for sure. And please try to put only uh, essential deliverables. Ideal is to have one deliverable per work package. You need to fill in this table, of course, explaining the details about the work package and to give enough details about how the work package would look like and possibly break it into tasks. With respect to your deliverables, there are a few types of deliverables. An obvious one is a report, a document. Sometimes it's a demonstrator, it's a prototype or a design. It might be also something like a website or a pattern filling, some kind of document. Uh, but also it can be other, like a software, a technical diagram, a, a mock-up, whatever. And then one important thing is the dissemination level, meaning are you going to give all this deliverable open to the public? In principle, the European Commission has some strategy to, to give the deliverables uh, open to the public. However, this is about building a company, and this is about trade secrets, and this is about commercial interests, and this is about all that stuff. In that sense, you need to be able to identify early on which deliverables can be provided as open. This might be some kind of market research or some results from the experiments or whatever, something that you feel comfortable sharing without uh, violating your interests and your trade uh, secrets. And with the other things that, it, that they are like your pre proprietary knowledge, this one you should keep them as uh, confidential. And yes, uh, the officers will keep them confidential. They have all a very strict uh, framework under which they are operating. You have nothing to be afraid of the officers stealing your ideas or your uh, deliverables and giving you somewhere else. It, it's not going to happen. Milestones, that they're requesting milestones are important critical points in the project, but they're actually demonstrating that the project is fully on track. They're demonstrating that you can, uh, uh, you have achieved some, let's say, uh, uh, results which allow you to move forward. It's very good idea to have milestones 
in each of the year of the project and certainly in each of the reporting periods, because this way the reviewers and the, ex the external, but also the officer, can identify on whether your project is on the right track. The milestone is the, I would say, the high level uh, element that one can check to see if you are right on track. Budget, again, uh, sorry for repeating it quite a few times, but we do have some very good uh, uh, training, especially on the financial and the budget. Please feel free to go to our website and our YouTube channel to, to see this one available. Generally speaking, you have to have categories related to the person month costs, the staff costs, travel costs, costs that have to do with equipment, costs that have to do with consumables. When it comes to equipment, be careful. It's only the depreciation of the equipment according to the national legislation and not anything else, not the full cost meaning. If your, the sum of travel, equipment, and goods and services exceeds 15% of your personnel costs, you need to fill in in a very detailed way this table about justification. I suggest you to do it anyway. It gives a very good element of your proposal that you are moving along the right way. And then, subcontracting and third parties. In principle, don't try to subcontract too much. Uh, most likely the, the evaluator will not like it. Explicitly explain why you need to subcontract this particular work and also please explicitly explain the measures to comply with the best value for money principle, meaning that because it's taxpayers' money, you need to convince them that you are using it as if it was your money, that you are buying the best value for money uh, services since you are also co-financing the action, and uh, it's, it's quite important to make sure that you have some uh, procedures in place to select the best vendors. For example, to take three offers or to make a, to make a request for proposals to five companies or to have a list of pre-defined uh, vendors. There are ways to, to explain that. Also, uh, when it comes to linked third parties, this might might not be relevant for you, but a linked third party is an uh, affiliated entity. For example, if your uh, headquarters, uh, you have a company in Turkey, but you also have one subsidiary company in Ireland and you want to do business from there as well, the Irish company, which is the daughter company of your company, is a linked third party. And then you have the in-kind contribution, which is uh, third parties offering uh, some activity that is uh, in kind without being the uh, for example, if they're here, you by borrowing you some equipment or seconding some personnel into the activities of the project. These are also very extreme cases. I'm assuming that the most of you will not deal with them. Then we have the annexes. A quick reminder about the annexes. I have already mentioned it. First one is security and ethics might not be very relevant for many of you, but if it is relevant, you have to go through the questionnaire. Then is the annex about the CVs. Then is annex three about the others, where you have the possibility to put all these letters of support and letters of uh, commitment. Annex four is about the Excel spreads to your financial information. This thing that you have to do completely in collaboration with your accountant. And last, and very important, is the pitch deck. Let me explain a couple of things about the pitch deck. First of all, how is the process? Now you submit a proposal and you submit the pitch deck together with the proposal. Then, if your proposal is evaluated positively, you will be invited for the interview. And this is the point that you are presenting your pitch deck. But you are submitting your pitch deck now and you don't have the right to change it. So, be prepared that whatever you submit now as your pitch deck, this is the thing that you are going to present. You cannot change. And there are practically 10 minutes and the, these are the topics you need to cover, the purpose of your company, the problem and the solution, the value proposition, market opportunity and risks, competition, business model, commercialization and marketing, strategy, financial projections, team, and final conclusions. So this is more or less what you need to put here. Keep in mind that uh, to use only one slide per heading, meaning so that this will be like two, four, six, eight, eleven slides, all in all. Uh, some recommendations take into account the award criteria, the ones that we have been summarizing for every uh, section. 
and address them all in your pitch appropriately. When you're preparing the proposal, don't leave the pitch for the last moment, for the last evening, because then you will submit something which is of low quality. Keep in mind that you have only 10 minutes to present. Keep in mind that you need to explain in your technology language that avoids jargon. Everybody can understand. Visuals are important. Text uh, does not help too much in such presentations. And remember that you cannot update it. It should not exceed 10 megabytes and it should be a separate PDF file. And then some tips and tricks from successful uh, pitches. Try to answer some very simple questions. What are you selling? Who are their customers? And why they should care? And then try to highlight some things. So if you're already making some money, try to mention it. Try to engage the audience with your way of presenting by looking at them, by asking questions, by, by uh, performing a kind of a show. But, uh, I would say a normal uh, in a normal way. Don't exaggerate on that. Very important aspect is storytelling. Try to explain how someone can solve real life problems by using your products or services. Be prepared that there will be lots of questions and answers. So it's good to to also to do lots of rehearsals with respect to that, and try to be clear, positive, and credible. And these are the things. Be yourself. Be natural. Be honest. And these are the tips that can help you go through the interview process if, of course, your proposal is uh, good enough to be invited towards it. Now, going back to the criteria. Philip, I think non-bankability is the most critical aspect. Am I correct? Um, well, there are several of them, but non-bankability is a key factor. Um, it's it's a difficult concept to understand, but it's um, a question of, you know, could it work without the funding, really? I mean, the Commission are asking this to see whether you're justifying the need for the funding that they can offer. And as I said earlier, they're interested in risk, not success in that sense. So the more non-bankable, the better in their sense. Um, except that it shouldn't be so non-bankable, it doesn't stand as an idea with potential. You're striking it somewhere in between, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I find it extremely difficult to define, uh, I would say, uh, balance between being non-bankable because you are too deep tech and too complicated and being non-bankable because your idea doesn't make sense. And <laughs> we have to be very careful when we're standing uh, in between those. Uh, Just to say, they had from one of the evaluators, they said that if the project goes out for evaluation and all the evaluators give it a green light, um, then they're quite concerned that there isn't an element of risk. If they all give it a red light, of course, it's not workable. But the Commission likes something in between where there are a few red lights. Uh, so that they can home in on the risk that they're funding. It's a, it's a strange mindset to get into, but they're looking for the element of risk that nobody else will support that will get the project to uh, a commercial uh, commercial success. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Yasemin, when it comes to budgets, what do you think are the, the biggest mistakes that you normally see in proposals coming from Turkey? What are the things that you would like to ask people to avoid? Uh, in terms of budget, uh, I think, uh, you know, the uh, personal cost is very low in Turkey compared to Europe. So the budget made by the Turkish companies is quite reasonable, actually, compared to European uh, companies. Uh, sometimes they allocate too much uh, budget equipment, uh, Gregoris. And uh, I think it's not uh, very preferable. Uh, most of the budget should be allocated to personal costs. And if the company is allocating uh, more than half or even half of the budget to equipment or travel or other costs, it's maybe considered uh, a bit negative by the evaluators. I think that's okay. one uh, important note. But as I said, the uh, costs are quite low in Turkey compared to Europe because of the exchange rate. 
so we don't see much extreme budget in the Turkish companies. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you very much. And now I think it's the time to move to a little bit of uh, our poll for a couple of questions more. Just, uh, just one point before we move on. You mentioned the pitch deck, um, Gregorius. In delivering that pitch deck, it's a personal thing. You mentioned the limited time. So a lot of people are nervous and want to show that they're capable. So they can begin by apologizing, you know, saying something like, uh, I don't often present, but here we go. Or I'll load this into my computer. Hopefully it will work. If you're technologists, you know, you don't say those things. Um, and then if you're, uh, I have to say this, a boring looking, boring sounding person like me, then, you know, you have a disadvantage over those who are energized, enthusiastic and younger like Gregorius. So, you know, you have to think, you have to think, um, noticed I wasn't sexist there and say Yasmin. Um, mm -hmm. You have to think about who's presenting, how you're presenting, whether your English is good enough to present. Then you have to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse if you're lucky to get to that point and have a team which represents all of the aspects of the company, not for technologists, but, you know, for including marketing, finance, and then you have to have someone fire questions at you that they may ask, and you have to know the answers. So there's a lot more to presenting than 10 slides. Yeah? Correct. Thank you very much. So now let's, let's uh, learn a little bit more about you. So do you guys feel that currently you miss any competencies in your team? Let me see your vote. Some people say that they miss, most people so far say that they miss both. Let me see, other ideas. Is there anybody who believes that you're not missing anything? You have the stellar team and you're now ready to come to the market. Good. Couple more, I'm, I'm surprised, Gregorius. We have 26 people at the moment listening to us. Only six are responding. I wonder why that is. Yes, I would like to kindly invite the rest of you to respond, to, to give us their ideas. I think you can get, it's easy. You, it's just you press the hashtag, it's uh, N119. You join Slido and then you're just casting your vote. It will not take you more than a couple of seconds to do it, but it will help us to improve. Uh, uh, first of all, it will help us to understand the context a little bit so that we can improve the content. But also, to be honest with you, it's a way of keeping some level of interaction with the team because otherwise it's quite more difficult. Let's see, anybody? Come on, guys. Out of the rest, 21 still didn't answer. No, it's okay. So, Let's suppose that we have a representative uh, answer now, and it seems that the majority of the teams, as you mentioned before, uh, Philip and uh, Yasin had also highlighted, they seem to be missing sales and business competencies, more rather than technical ones. Now, how is your experience in finance? Do you have experienced financial people within the team? Do you have an internal accountant, an employee that works in your company? Do you have an external accountant? Or there is no previous experience. That's very important. You have an external accountant. Good. Let's see other, other uh, answers to that. The team itself has experience in finance. That's also very good. Any other ideas with that? Internal accountant. Whether internal or external. Please prepare your accountant about the work they have to do with the financial tables. If they haven't started it yet so far, I think that there is not too much time. And believe me, it might be a little bit more tricky than it looks, particularly if you have to calculate projections for the future. 
therefore we need to walk along these lines. Okay, great. Next question for you, and I don't want to make you stressed, but have you already prepared the budget for your project? Do you know what we are going to claim to the European Commission in the ESA Accelerator? Let's see. I see that it looks like a tight game here. Some of you have done it, but uh, there are many of you who already, you haven't finished yet, you have already done some preliminary research. My strong encouragement to all of you is to do it, to engage, finish your budget as soon as possible, and try to connect them with the work packages and with the activities in a, in a, in a I would say, normal and uh, convincing way. Okay, it seems that the majority of the proposals, at least from the people who are answering, and I'm, I would like to still encourage you to answer, uh, are, uh, are very much into that. Now, uh, I would like to ask for your advice. I do still have a couple of questions in my poll. We need to have some time for Q&A session, but I also have the chance to, to show you some successful uh, companies from the EIC Accelerator or from the SMEs from the previous phases uh, through another presentation. Philip, what is your suggestion? Because I know that, that we don't have too much time. Well, I think, I mean, we've dealt with all the questions as we've gone along and there are none outstanding at the moment. So. I suggest you, you go through case studies. Uh, before I go through case studies, I have another two questions and then I will finish with the case, I will finish with the case studies. When it comes to your proposals, the ones that you are planning to submit, what is in your opinion the strongest aspect of your proposal? Is it about the technology? Is it about that you have a great business model? Is it about your team, the financial, something else? Please let us know. What do you believe is the strongest aspect of your proposal now that you are writing? Now that you are Closer to the microphone, Gregoris. Oh, close. Yes, yes. I, I tend to forget because it's. I, I used to wait this one to the, the the battery went away during the talk. <laughs> I see some people have some good uh, also in terms of strong proposals in terms of business model. Any other ideas? What is the, the strongest aspect of your proposals? Financials. That's also an interesting aspect. Business models seem to be moving well. Technology remaining the dominant. Let me see a few of ideas more. Great. And now the other question is: What is, in your opinion, the weakest part of your? What is the thing about your proposal that you feel a little bit insecure? Or you're not sure if this thing would actually pay off. Okay, I see many people are seeing gaps in the business model and the financials. As for the financials, uh, we discussed before, please feel free to visit our uh, YouTube channel. You will see lots of information there. And we went really into detail uh, for every aspect of the financial issue. But Philip, uh, I think that the answers more or less are confirming your uh, initial statements that we have an amazing technology background normally in Turkish companies, but we need a little bit extra effort to cover the business model and the market, the sales component. So, yeah. and you know, that, that's in a way that's quite sad. I mean, there are some excellent ideas out there and some very good people. So, you know, I think they need to recognize the the need for that element in their business which is difficult when no one in the business is from that background um they need to recognize and and do something about it if they think it's commercializable um you know then i mean i've been in high-tech companies i've been employed in and i've managed high-tech companies and the marketing and financial people are somewhat frowned upon it's, it's almost considered by some technologies a sort of dirty word, you know, selling, marketing. Um, it's not seen as the sort of thing they want to be involved in. And the last thing you need is a technical person trying to sell. 
Uh, some salespeople can sell technical, but technical people rarely can sell because they immediately switch to technology. And if you're selling to a board of a company, um, you may have one person who's technical and who's supporting your bid, but the others will be financial, marketing and the rest, as with the panel of evaluators. And you're impressing perhaps one person with the technical aspect. Uh, I'm an engineer myself and accountants are always the sworn enemy of engineers because whatever the engineer wants to do with the fantastic research and the piece of equipment they want to, they want to buy, the accountant will always say we can't afford it or it's not justified. So there's always an inner conflict in companies, which results, of course, ultimately in a team effort. But um, you can't ignore the fact you do need financial help. You do need marketing help if you intend selling at the end of the day. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, I will go now to the last quick part. I will skip this part explaining you that the uh, EC Accelerator is the successor of uh, SME instrument phase two. I will also skip the statistics. I don't think they make too much sense anymore because the program has changed. But I'd like to demonstrate to you some successful uh, companies. Here, there is a case that I would like to highlight exactly for this reason. You mentioned earlier that uh, uh, uh, technical co-founders in, in Turkey are not very reluctant to, to give the will to somebody else. Let's look at another case. Let's look at this Iris company called Nuritas. So why this company was super successful? They, they got funded and they, they successfully finished the project. First of all, because they had huge traction. And second, because they had the right mix between corporate and science. And look at this lady. She started from math academics to, to, to, to establish a biotech company. The company is uh, using IT and life sciences expertise to understand, uh, to mine DNA and protein data so they can understand if they can create new food components that they can prevent, manage, or even possibly cure disease. So it's a kind of a big data enabled Ayurveda, that you ask. But look at this. Once she established the company, once she realized that the company reaches up to a level, then she appoints the former Pfizer president from the pharmaceutical company as its CEO. She steps down herself from the CEO. She becomes the chief scientific officer. She realizes that she created something bigger than her. And she is getting into that. So she's stepping back. She understands that her role as a chief scientist is to continue leading the technical developments, the scientific developments, and she brings a real CEO on the table. I will not go through this. Of course, one of the other things that they had, they have already attracted huge investors. Some of the early investors were even the Bono and Edge from the U2 famous fund. And they, after that, they raised another 30 million euros from the European Investment Bank to scale up global. Another case. Okay. Uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel is not as famous as Bono, possibly, but uh, more important for our everyday lives uh, in a way. Here we're talking about a very solid. Can't, she can't sing as well either, Gregorius. <laughs> Uh, we have a very solid technical uh, solution and we have a very realistic business model. Uh, it's about a company that is working on uh, storing hydrogen in the, in the liquid form as it would be by storing some oil. And uh, this was founded by a very strong technical team, but also included uh, business people. And they achieved, when they got funded, they have already achieved some very remarkable uh, results. 80% of the operating cost reduction. They have already a sales contract of uh, 1.5 million. And they had very big, but uh, ambitious, but uh, realistic targets to have 90 million revenues and 235 employees three years after the, uh, completing the project. This is the level of, of ambition that we need in this type of projects, that we need companies that will show the capacity to scale up, to stop being an SME anymore, or to be an, on the borderline. And the third, we have another case, which you will not see any famous people in the pictures. You will not see some, something that will, uh, is crazy high-tech. We are talking here about a nanomaterial, which is a, a low-cost uh, aerogel-type nanomaterial, which is supposed to be used in construction and so on. 
What we think was the competitive advantage of these guys is that they had a very well organized project and they kept everything simple. So again, very clear, mature uh, ideas about uh, the, the benefits, the economic benefits. They have their, uh, they are uh, looking at a huge market. They will also be able to have a final design and then they will be able after that to, to go into TRL9 uh, and uh, push the products in the market. Again, they were aiming at the turnover to 25.7 million and uh, earnings before taxes and interest and debts at 15 million euros by 2022. And this is a very important thing that I would like to focus. This is my main motivation for showing you this particular uh, project, is the simplicity of the project. It all looks like a nice IKEA uh, living room. Nothing super fancy, but everything is in place. So, the first four package is obviously the project management, but then what they're doing is they're validating their manufacturing process, they're validating the, the, the so they're validating the production process, they're validating with customers in different four different trials, and actually one of those goes outside of Europe to demonstrate their global potential. Of course, they're disseminating the results and they're finalizing their business plan and their go-to-market strategy. Simple rules. Validate the production process, validate the product, become investor ready, and let your stakeholders know about it. If you follow these simple steps, uh, I think that this is a very difficult to miss strategy. And after that, I think that I will stop sharing my screens. I have gone through the uh, points. I think it's time to give the floor to questions, but also to you, Yasemin and Philip, for concluding remarks. I think um, I think the last um, slide there was very important. Try and keep it simple. Try and explain. As um, reviewers of proposals, it has to be remembered. You're in a way you're looking for a reason to reject a proposal, not to to pass it. And if you get something that um, looks boring, reads boring, is over complex, doesn't have diagrams is difficult to follow, that's going to lose in preference to something that isn't. So from the word go, the summary, it has to be punchy, catchy, and then throughout, you know, try and keep it straightforward, not too much technical language, don't overdo the technology, and have a few simple diagrams and flowcharts that uh, explain what you're trying to get to. In terms of the, the questions, we've had uh, 20 questions, 21 questions from uh, around 30 people, so everybody's been asking questions. Um, in the ones I've seen, and I'm sure Yasmin can uh, can expand on it, um, a few questions about um, how you show um, the need for employees, whether you need to recruit at the beginning or not. Uh, and the answer from both of us on that um, was that you can recruit as part of the proposal. Um, but show how you've arrived at the figures you're mentioning. So if you need a marketing professional, you can recruit one, uh, but if you put market potential in your bid, show how you've arrived at that. Um, you can always, of course, employ external people to do this if you don't have the talents yourself. Um, there was a question, can one company have more than one project bid at the same time? No, one company, one project. Um, Target markets, very important. We see a lot of people who say we're going to sell to Europe. Now, just the EU alone, uh, 27 countries um, and different languages, different rates of development, different regulations, different competition. Um, and language is important, of course. Um, it, you know, if you have German speakers or agents, fine. But if you don't speak German, you're not going to sell in Germany. So, um, important to focus on your actual market on the basis of competition, potential, price, and the ease of selling in that country, perhaps through agents, um, uh, or if it's direct, you show how you can cope with that. Um, and the final one, risks and mitigation. Um, there was talk in one of the questions about uh, some competition coming in 
um, and sort of taking the market, that's obviously a risk. Uh, if you're bidding, you show how you mitigate that risk. Um, if you can't mitigate the risk, then the project's not going to get very far. So you know, no one's going to listen if you complain about competition. You have to show how you can compete or you don't compete. Yasmin, anything to add to that? Thank you. I think you covered everything. Ah, right. <laughs> um, all that has to be said is that those questions are recorded uh, in terms of noted um, with the responses. They will appear on our website uh, along with all the presentations you've seen and lots of other information about finance and uh, technology readiness levels and business strategy. Uh, so please do take a look at it. Um, I guess that's all from me. So thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting. Um, back to you, Grigoris and Yasmin. Thank you very much. I have no further comments. I would like to thank the participants uh, for, uh, uh, for their engagement. I think that uh, uh, the proposal writing uh, comes uh, in a virtual way we are still experimenting, but I see some good response, and I think that uh, we will soon have the chance to to meet physically. So, thank you very much. I said the floor to you. Oh, just just one final point, by the way. Uh, there was an option to some companies for us to take a look at any drafted proposals. Um, contact Kamal, uh, the contact you have for this event, if you have that uh, that point to pursue. Sorry, Yasmin. No problem. Uh, Karthi, would you like to add anything or shall I just close the session? No, thank you for your efforts. That's the only thing I want to say. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm closing the session and uh, thank you, Grigoris and Philip. Katıldığınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Bugünkü webinar umarım faydalı olmuştur. E, tüm e, etkinliklerimizin sunumları ve webinarların kayıtlarına e, web sitemizden ulaşabilirsiniz. E, www.turkeyin.h2020.eu web sitesinden hepsine ulaşabilirsiniz. E, bir 30 dakika daha saat bir buçuğa kadar bu Zoom platformu açık olacak. Eğer sorularınız olursa buradan yazabilirsiniz. E, biz gidiyoruz ama e, bu soruların cevapları da gene web sitesinden paylaşılacak tekrar. E, o yüzden 30 dakika aklınıza gelen soru varsa bu chat box'tan yazmaktan çekinmeyin lütfen. E, bir sonraki webinarımız 28 Eylül'de olacak. E, biliyorsunuz bu senelik son katılıp 7 Ekim'de, Akseleratör programının son katılıp 7 Ekim'de özellikle katılıp yakın tuttuk ki e, gerçekten proje başvurusu yapacak olan firmalar e, proposallarını o tarihe kadar hazırlamış olsunlar ki akıllarına takılan spesifik sorular olursa ki mutlaka olacaktır diye düşünüyorum. Ee, bizi zaten hem TÜİKAK'tan e, yetkililerimiz, Tarık Beyler, hem uzmanlarımız, hem ben burada oluyor ve sorularınızı, spesifik sorularınızı teklifinizle ilgili e, cevaplıyor olacağız. Çok faydalı olacağını düşünüyorum. 28 Eylül. E, gene TÜİKAK aracılığıyla size davet ulaştırılacaktır. E, tekrar teşekkür ediyoruz. Lütfen e, bu ekrandaki QR koda ekleyerek eğitimle ilgili feedback vermeyi unutmayın lütfen. Bunları da gene 28 Eylül'deki yeni etkinliğimizde değerlendirip sizlere daha iyi bir hizmet sunmaya çalışıyor olacağız. Tekrar teşekkür ediyoruz her şey için. Görüşmek üzere, hoşçakalın.